Welcome, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk with Sister E. And everybody knows I'm Sister E. So um, I wanted to kind of have a conversation today. Uh, I know that one of the um, hottest, hottest conversation within the Israelite community and the Christian community is the commandments. And the biggest thing that we have a conversation about is the feast days and Sabbath. So what I decided to do was bring on a couple of people with different perspectives when it comes to that. And uh, with that, we're going to bring, you know, our insight, what we think as uh, individuals and believers. Now, I will say everybody on this panel believes in what? Christ is our salvation. And we also believe that the only way uh, and you also have to receive the Holy Spirit. So make that clear. All of us believe in that. But there are certain individuals that see things differently when it comes to the feast days and Sabbath. So uh, actually, I got the idea of watching uh, Elder Holloway a couple of last week talk about it. And I said, you know what? I said, I need to bring some folks on so we can kind of come together. So let me get started first with introducing who I have on the panel today. So first I have Elder Mike Holloway. Uh, can you introduce yourself to the people, Elder Holloway? Sure. Praise the Lord, everybody. I am Elder Mike Holloway from Detroit, Michigan, Power, Hope and Grace Bible Church. Uh, thank you, Sister E. Appreciate the invite. I'm excited about this topic. I think it's an important one and a good one to discuss, even amongst those that uh, perhaps has have different views. So certainly we appreciate the invite and we're just looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. All right. All right. Elder Holloway is one of those that I have a lot of respect for in the Christian community. Because one thing I will say, when he comes to the table and want to have conversation, and I saw him do this with Ron, it was very respectful. So I will commend you for that, my brother. All sure. right. So next I have Pastor, uh, Pastor Kelly Richardson. You know the people know you, so but still introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, you just you gave my name, though. You already did it, right? No, I'm, just <laughs> you. Um, I'm Pastor um, Kelly Richardson, uh, Pastor of Passion for Reconciliation. Uh, we've been in ministry for now almost 11 years, and uh, we transitioned uh, from Christianity over, you know, just completely out of uh, Christianity in terms of like when you start dealing with the denominations and all that stuff. So we completely transitioned our ministry out of Christianity, and um, we located in Richmond, Virginia. All right, all right. Soon to be, I'm going to be in that area, so I'm excited about it. All right, now we have Pastor Renice Kirkland. Come on, introduce yourself, sis. Hey, hey. You know you too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, everyone. I'm going to say shalom to my family and to other ones. I'm going to say grace, peace, and many blessings unto you. I am Pastor Renice Kirkland. Um, I am the senior leader of Pinnacle Worship Assembly located in Canton, Ohio. I have an amazing, awesome husband, Elder Greg Kirkland, who absolutely supports me and I love him. Absolutely. Um, I also want to be respectful and um, mention my leader, my covering Apostle Keith K. Curry, um, who is uh, the presiding um, bishop for Higher Ground Ministries of the World. I've been in ministry for officially, I say, leading a assembly for the past two years. So I'm excited to be here and I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Now we have the infamous. Don't do that. <laughs> Dr. Jenny. Come on, introduce yourself. See, she ain't been on my panel in a minute. Well, we had the women. I, know. So I had to, I had to drop off for a few. I had to drop off for a little bit and and you know restructure some things in ministry. But my name is Shalom, everyone. My name is Dr. Janet Noel. I am the prelate of Yeshiva Worship International Fellowship. Uh, I've been in ministry and leadership in ministry since probably about 2003, 2002. Um, I'm excited about being here tonight. No, I haven't been on many panels lately. I just needed a breather. I, can I be honest with you? Yes. I got tired of all the strife that was going back and forth, so I just removed myself from it. But um, I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm glad to be amongst my brothers and my sisters, and I'm excited about uh, the conversation that we're going to have. Amen. This is going to be fun. Amen. Last but not least, my brother, my partner in crime, Mr. Minister Jacobo. Come on, let people know who you are, sir. Salama family. Uh, good to be back again. Um, you know, Yakoba with Tail Ministries. Uh, we have our YouTube channel ministry uh, where we teach in time prophecy, 
um, you know, many things concerning the Bible. And, um, you know, our viewpoint is all about truth and serving the Most High Yah, uh, you know, lifting up Christ, Yeshua. And uh, yeah. no matter what the cost is, uh, you know, we willing to, to pay that price to serve him. Uh, so um, looking forward to this uh, discussion. All right. Amen. All right. So, family, what we come to talk about is first, let's talk about Sabbath. Because I know um, one thing I, I noticed is the Christian community and the Israelite community see things different uh, when it comes to as far as the, um, I want to say the priority of it or how we perceive it to be. Um, and I know with some churches, one, as far as Christian community, you know, they believe that, you know, Sabbath is, I'm going to let, I'm going to let Mike Halloway speak on that, but let me first start with Pastor Kirkland. What's your viewpoint on Sabbath, sis? Um, first, I would say that I believe Sabbath is very much important. Um, you know, when you come into this truth and you start um, operating and you start teaching in a format where there are so many different beliefs, um, whether it be on the Christian side or the Hebrew side, one of the things that's very important is we have to be able to put things in the proper perspective, like what are the non-salvation issues that we can have a disagreement about? Um, what are the things that we can talk about? And if we don't agree, it's okay. But then when it comes to certain things like the feast days and the Sabbath, to me, that is part of a salvation issue because we understand and if we all agree that there is the Father and that we believe in Yeshua, um, the son, the only begotten son of the father and his mission and purpose was to come and save his people. We use him as an example to model and pattern our lives after. So the whole key in us embracing our culture um, as Israelites, as well as ascribing to um, using the Torah for our guide, because that is what exactly uh, how we live and how we get our instruction. Um, it's just kind of weird that throughout the entire Bible, he said, I came in the volume of the book. And so even in the Old Testament, as we say in the New Testament, um, we see that the Sabbath was something that was continuous. And so it's important to understand, um, and I've been teaching my congregation, we started um, delving into Torah and really understand that Pastor Kelly did an awesome job last night with yeah, teaching. Um, because I, you know, I talk, you know, Pastor Kelly, you know, we've we've gone back, but I always look at it as a confirmation because honestly, even with me understanding that the Sabbath is important, it's important because the Sabbath is a marker and a sign of who we are to listen. Some say God, um, Yahweh, I don't want to disrespect anyone. So to the most high, um, Yah. That is a marker and a sign specifically in the world where there's no rhyme or reason. So then my thing is, how do we tunnel through to get an understanding that Hasatan absolutely came to flip everything that the Most High put in place to benefit him? So now my thing goes to, it's not something that should be new or should be something that takes us out of what the norm is according to the scripture. Whatever we do, it should still model the same pattern of what was established from the very beginning. So if the most high is simple points to me, and I'm gonna let you guys have your way, and I appreciate you let me go first, amen, come on. Um, if the most high rested, period, point blank, come on. he rested, what harm is it in us, whether Christian, whether Hebrew, whatever is, whatever you want to say, why wouldn't we want to do that? If he, the creator of everything, set precedent and hallowed and sanctified one particular day. Yes, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. I get it. Because the same way that I worship and praise him on the Sabbath, I do it every day of the week. That's my lifestyle. It's not something I go in and out of. So my thing with the Sabbath is it's very important because it's a sign and it's a marker. It allows the most high to know that because I'm in relationship with him the right way, I am absolutely going to make it a point to search out this scripture to make sure that I'm in tune and connected with him by any means necessary. I'm going to, my life, my faith and my works must mirror 
So it shouldn't be something opposite and we shouldn't get so caught up in the different doctrines picking away points when the bottom line is Sabbath means rest. He said one day give it all to me because it's not just for him. It's for us to rejuvenate. It's for us to get our bearings together, not just us, but the land, the cows, the animals, everything was created for a reason and a purpose. And so we got to go back to what is the purpose? Sabbath, um, my point is, I want to just reiterate is, it's about a sign. So when we done with all the lip service, our life have to model what it is we talk about. And my faith, with if I don't talk about it, you should be able to see that I'm lining up with that word. All right, at the gate, it's getting, getting good. Anybody want to go first? Until I said, uh, Pastor Reduce going to start it out. Right? Who want to go first on it? Okay, Dr. Janet. I on. just want to just piggyback off of what my sister said. And, you know, as I was researching, even concerning the Sabbath, according to Ge Ge uh, National Ge Geographic, the people who keep the Sabbath are more healthier than the people who don't. Now, this is research. These are statistics. And also, even in the beginning, like she said, when Most High rested on the seventh day, it wasn't that he needed to rest, but that was an example of what we needed to do. Yeah. We need to rest, and the earth needs a rest on the seventh day. And like Pastor Kelly said, I just love my brother. His teachings just be blowing my mind. Like he said, it's, it's not a... Uh, 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 we're not confused about the seventh day. We're just confused about what we're not confused about the Sabbath. We're confused about the seventh day or just what day, what time it is, it, according to the calendar. And so when it comes to the Sabbath, a lot of people, they argue the point of whether it's on Sunday or whether it's on Saturday. And if we keep to the scriptures, if we keep to what is said in the book, then we know that the Sabbath falls on the seventh day and Sunday is actually the first day. So my my point in all of this is sometimes we're going to have disagreements, but it's very important to stand on what you know and know what you know so that when you do have these conversations, you don't have to leave angry with them one another. You just need to be able to express what you know, let them express what they know, and then agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. If that's what happens and people say, oh, I don't like to say that. I like to say that I'd rather agree to disagree with you in order to maintain a relationship that is healthy and fruitful than to sit and argue a point where we should not be releasing the word in strife. We should not be arguing over the word. The scripture speaks for itself. And that's why it's so important that we need to study to show ourselves approved unto y'all workers that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so when we understand that, we know that rightly dividing the word of truth is not uh, us understanding the word because the study part is us understanding the word. The rightly dividing the word of truth is us dispersing and dispensing the word out amongst the people and the believers. I know with myself keeping the Shabbat, understand this. Not only he said that he is the, you know, Yeshua is the master of the Sabbath, but understand this as well. Just like our bodies need rest, the earth need rest from our activity in it. And this is why the resources are um, drying up because no one is honoring that seven. Uh, well, I shouldn't say no one. I take it back. Many are not honoring that seventh day of rest because they don't understand it. They really believe that it was switched to Sunday where most high's word is unchanging and mutable. That's what the word is, that it's immutable. He didn't switch it to Sunday. Mankind switched it to Sunday. And so I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that uh, Pastor Pastor. Uh, Renee said, I agree uh, wholeheartedly uh, concerning that. I'm, I'm very glad that I keep the Shabbat. I'm very, you know, I even talk to my family members about the Shabbat. I'm very, I, there's so much to learn. And even with the Shabbat, this is a time that we come together. It, it gives family time again. It's a time we come together and learn more and get more intimate with the Most High. It's a time we come together to understand scriptures and discuss scriptures with one another and fellowship, quantania, fellowship with one another. So I appreciate the word of God. And I appreciate uh, the teachings, even that our brother has shared and just enlightened our community so much. I appreciate understanding that most high, this Shabbat is a mandate from him. This is not something we do if we want to. This is a mandate from him. And by us violating the Shabbat, we find ourselves in our body sickly because we continue to go. We continue to move in the earth. And he's saying, I want you to rest. I want your body to regenerate. I want your body to recuperate. And so that's what I just want to share. Just piggybacking off of what Pastor Renee said because she said so much. And if we, you know, if we love him, we need to keep his commandments. That's the fourth commandment. That's the fourth commandment. You know, so I'm just going to, I'm going to release the mic right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is good conversation. I'm going to let everybody else kind of jump in. 
because somebody like Luke Meek, who's, who's been in the truth for a minute, I've still been holding on to certain aspects of, you know, the other things that I've done before this and understanding the Bible and the commandments. And this is still a transition for me, you know, um, because the biggest thing I struggled with at times was understanding the Sabbath uh, and, and, and the feast day. Uh, and that's something that I, at times I'm just like, you know, I need more of a re revelation. And the more I begin to study, I understand that that rest was that rest was set aside for us. Like you said, Dr. Janet, for us to rejuvenate, get our bodies together, get our minds together, because we work five days a week, nonstop. And the most high said, set this time aside because he set it aside for us to get ourselves together. Because if we keep going, keep going, not only will we miss revelation for them, because let's be real, when I'm at work, all day long, I'm thinking about work. I'm still right. in the most high, but I'm working. My, my mind is focused on what we consider to be the plow, my yeah. job. But when I come out of work, I got to reset. But then I'm still trying to reset and do my day to day. I have to still make sure my, you know, my daughter's taken care of, things are taken care of. But that Saturday, it's like I got to stop for a minute. I have to rest. And what's interesting is sometimes when I used to take that rest, I would watch online ministries. Like I used to watch um, Tell You Ministries. Before I came across you all, I watched every Saturday morning cooking my breakfast. We either watch uh, Pastor Darby online and it would just be a reset for me. So I see the importance of it now. Pastor, uh, Kelly, you have anything or you call Mr. Yeah. You uh, could go ahead if you if you want. Or if not, I could go either way. Um, so I think when we talk about the Sabbath and the feast days, because that's what we're talking about. Right. Um we have to make the distinction between whether or not it's good for us. Like for instance, is it good to have a day off? Yes or no? Yes, it is good to have a day off. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now there's a difference between whether or not it's good for you and whether or not it's pleasing or displeasing to God, right? So we have the idea of the law that you had to keep. Right, which you know the Sabbath fought fell under that, right under the ten. Right now, the question is: Does your keeping of the Sabbath make God happy? Are you pleasing Him by keeping the Sabbath? See, this is the conversation. The conversation is between law and grace, right? And so, because we all can agree that we should have a day off, we all can agree that we should have a Sabbath rest. But, you know, the, the complexities of it is, does it please God? Because God said, I hate your Sabbath days, your new moons, your feast days. Why? 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 The reason he said that, because he wants more than that. He wants more than the outward manifestation of you keeping some law. Right. And that, that's the discussion. And I, I guess as we go on, we need to have. And um, you, um, just to piggyback off of what uh, Jacoba pointed out, um, when we understand the Shabbat, and as um, Dr. Newell uh, pointed out, um, I, I did a lesson reconstructing the Hebrew calendar. I use scripture and historical information. Um, so I encourage everyone to, to take a look at that. And the issue, um, this, you know, it's not the seventh day Shabbat, you know, because many will say, uh, we don't know what day uh, we're, we're, we're on because of the Gregorian calendar and all of that. But you go back on history, one thing that was not touched was the seven day cycle, period, no matter how we look at it. Um, and we do have records of that. But even then, uh, when we start looking at seasons and things like that, the Most High has given us signs, as Pastor Renise pointed out. Um, he's given us signs to be able to look at the trees and tell that we're getting ready to go into the fall season or getting ready to go into the spring season. So if many of the uh, you know, tribes of the antiquities were able to, uh, you know, uh, keep, you know, uh, or should I say um, pinpoint the solstice, the two solstice, the equinox. And, you know, if they were able to do that accurately, then, you know, we have um, technology now to where so there's no reason why we cannot pinpoint those days. So that's that's that that's part of the um, some of the issues that you hear. But the key to understanding the Shabbat, as um, Pastor Renice pointed out, um, the Shabbat is a sign, right? It's not just that, you know, uh, we're taking a day off to rest because the Most High is not just telling us to take a day off to rest. He wants us to what? Show adoration, show our appreciation for him corporately. 
Yeah, we could worship every day of the week. We already know that we can, you know, um, but he set aside a day for us to what? Show our adoration for him and to him. So it's not just a day of rest, you know, ceasing from our day to day things on this seventh day, but it's also what? To worship him, right? As a corporate, a, 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 you know, um, a corporate people. And so the key to understanding is the word bless, Barak. Barak means to salute, but it also means to what? Uh, show adoration, right? And vice versa. So when you understand salute and I'm prior military, and if you do not return a salute to anyone that salutes you, you can get into a lot of trouble because of not returning that salute. So the Most High showed his appreciation, showed his approval of his creation on that seventh day, and he saluted his creation. He saluted his creation and he put this in place so that way we all what return the salute back to him. It's not just about a day of rest. It's about what? Uh, coming together and worshiping him. Because many, including myself, I used to hide behind the narrative of saying, hey, you know what? Um, we had service on sh sun um, Sunday, the first day of the week, but we rested on the Shabbat. You know, so we, we still honored it because we rested. No, the most high wants us to do what? Show our appreciation to him. Worship him. You know, set that time aside for him, even though, again, we could do that all, every day out of the week. But he made a declaration and we're going to get into it some more. But the key is sign in Exodus chapter 31. He said this is a sign, not just on um, the seventh day Shabbat. He said all the Shabbat. He, he made it plural. That is a it's, it's a sign between he and his people for what ever, not something temporary. So we'll touch on that more. But I just wanted to just kind of uh, jump, you know, um, bring that word up, Barak. And then also we see the word uh, Quadash, which means um, to anoint. It means to consecrate. It means to ordain. So we see the very first what ordination service right there at the at the um, seven day creation. Right. That seventh day was an ordination service that the most high set aside to what consecrate his all of his creation, put a stamp of approval and show his adoration for his people. So guess what? Not just his people, but all creation. When he declared that everything he saw, everything he created is good. So we have to return. Uh, it's, it's not an option. It's a command. We have to return that salute back to the father. All right. Elder, you got something? Elder Holloway? You're on mute. You're on, let me unmute you. Is that it? Is that it? Better? Yeah. All right. Yeah. God bless you all. Certainly appreciate all the other perspectives. It's probably about to get a little interesting now because uh, <laughs> I'll come with, with somewhat a different perspective. However, let me clarify something for even some of my Christian brothers who don't understand this. The Sabbath was never changed to Sunday, right? That's just, that's a fallacy, right? And that's just never happened. Sunday is a date church gathers, but the Sabbath remains the same. It was always the seventh day. And so I want to make sure that biblical Christians understand that the Sabbath never changed to Sunday. Now, uh, the Sabbath is vitally important. However, where we're going to run into our differences is how we observe it. Not that it shouldn't be observed, because I think everyone on this panel would understand that it should be observed. However, how it should be observed is where we'll uh, disagree. I like something uh, Pastor Kirkland said because she said something uh, to the effect of going back to how it was in the beginning. Well, let's do that. Let's go back to how it was in the beginning. Surely God rested on the seventh day. However, you don't see a command from God to Adam to rest on the seventh day. You don't see a command to God to Adam's sons, Cain and Abel, and following that, Seth to rest on the Sabbath day. You never see a command to Noah, even after the flood, to rest on the Sabbath day. As a matter of fact, Abraham, our father of faith, who by faith, the faith that he has, we're all saved, placing it in Christ, you don't see a command to Abraham to rest on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath uh, ordinance to rest in the systematic practice that Israel followed was specific to a sovereign nation going into the land that God himself would give them. You got to understand, 
Israel within their land, the land of Canaan that God blessed them with after excommunicating the false uh, heathen nations, uh, the the religious laws were not just the religious laws. They governed their civil practices as well as any ceremonial practice. It was all governed. As a matter of fact, if we're going to be uh, strict to the law, if one violated the law according to the law, then it is all of our job to put them to death. That's if we're going to be according to the law. But you got to remember, God told Israel that if they did not keep the law, because those outward ceremonial aspects of the law were specific to the land, he told them, if you don't, I, the land will spew you out. And, and, and again, that's giving indication that there were some guidelines for a sovereign God over a sovereign nation that governed. See, see the whole nation was shut down in Israel because the religious law was not only the religious law, it was the civil law. And they could do that within that nation. That practice doesn't transcend into the new covenant outside of the land or the nation of Israel. We understand as true Christians that our Sabbath rest comes in Christ. And the greatest rest of all is to cease from sin. And we Christians, true biblical Christians who are led by the spirit, don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We rest in him in a couple of ways, and I'll stop. I know we'll get some feedback, but we rest in him in a couple of ways. One, we understand that our works are incapable of saving us. That was the problem with Israel in the first place. Romans chapter nine, Israel has not obtained. Why? Because she sought it by works and not by faith. Point number two, we understand that when Christ died on Calvary, he died for the sins of the world and all those that would place their faith in him. And when we do that, we rest from our labors. It's not that the law would justify us. The law can't justify us. We can only be justified through the precious blood of Christ who came according to the scriptures, right? And so it's, it's problematic when we try to take sovereign laws that were specific to a sovereign people in a sovereign land and cause them to transcend into this dispensation of grace. When we do that, we frustrate the grace of God because, and I'm not saying anyone on this panel does this, but many people often feel that by doing these works, somehow they're made righteous. And I'll just quote this last verse and I'll, I'll be quiet. But Paul addressed this in part in Romans chapter number 14, verse number five. He says, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. And so we understand that, number one, my Sabbath rest comes in Christ. And I celebrate it every day when I cease from my own labors, rest in the sacrificial work of Christ on Calvary, putting my trust in him and fleeing from the lust of the flesh. That's my rest. And I'm looking for the ultimate rest when Christ cracks the sky and calls the believers to be with him. All right. So who has a point to make? I'd like to. Uh, okay. I'm not going to be long. So I agree with uh, Elder Mike Holloway. Um, you know, a lot of the laws, many of the laws were dealing with a certain group of people, culture and land. Right. And so one thing I want to do is, you know, we have to make sure on whether or not we believe the whole Bible or not. Do we believe Paul's writing as well as the Old Testament? Do we believe Christ's statements as well, right? So I, I wanna read this right quick in this uh, Matthew chapter 12. It said, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice you would have condemned the innocent, 
for the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. So Christ said there is something greater than the Sabbath. See, we, we're, we're looking at the day. We think the day is making God happy. The day isn't making God happy. It's about Christ. He's great in the Sabbath. So if we talk about whether or not we go to quote unquote church or we celebrate and praise God on Saturday, right? Even that does not make God happy. Why? Because it's all about Christ. Uh, and I'm going to read one more thing and, and I'm, I'm going to pass it to, I think Pastor Kelly had his up. Uh, this is uh, dealing from Colossians chapter two. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are the shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is in Christ. So we want to ignore these scriptures about the reality of the Sabbath. The reality of the Sabbath is Christ. The narrow path is Christ. All of this is about Christ. So that's why God said in the Old Testament, he said, I hate your new moons, your Sabbath days, your feast days, because it's, it's outwardly you're trying to please him, but inwardly your heart is far from him, right? And so that's why we have this new covenant. That's why Christ says uh, he's going to give us a new heart, a heart of flesh. What's the difference between the heart of flesh and the, the, the heart of stone, right? Now, the original covenant, right, it was written on the tablets of stone. Now it moves, according to Jeremiah, to our heart. What is the difference between the laws being written on the tablets of stone and the laws being written on your heart? How do you access the laws written on your heart? You access it by faith in Christ and living through the power of the spirit. See, this, this is where we're moving from. We're moving from the legalistic nature of, of keeping the law, statutes, and commandment, the things lit, written on the tablets of stone, right? To a walk of faith. See, this is the difference. The, the difference is between the law and grace. The difference is between Christ and the spirit, right? It's about, it's about his spirit. And, and, um, uh, so I, I don't want to go on and on, but, uh, I just want to read this one thing and I'll let it go. Right. Because I just, I don't think I'll be making my point if I, if I don't read it. So it says in, uh, second Corinthians three, it says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that we are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are com competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but the spirit for the letter kill it. But the spirit gives life. So the spirit is where we live and we walk. He empowers us to live. He don't care about these outward manifestations. You know why? Because you're going to fail because your flesh is weak. You're never going to be perfect as which he, and he requires perfection. So yes, we, in my opinion, we should keep the Sabbath because the Sabbath is our day off. He gave us that grace. He gave the Sabbath to us so we can rest. And if we want to worship him on that day, we can. And if we don't want to do anything, note for a fact that in Matthew chapter 12, Christ and his, his apostles were walking in the grain field. They weren't in there worshiping. They were walking in the grain field. So we got we to gotta be balanced in the scriptures and understand, like Paul was talking about, the difference between the law and grace. And some people fall from, from grace. And the Bible says that uh, some people, they look towards that law, right? Why? Because there's a curse on them. Israel, he was talking about Israel. He says there's a veil over Israel because every time they come to the law of Moses, they can't understand. But the scripture says, but when they come to Christ, they can see. When they come to Christ, the veil is removed. When they come to Christ, they understand that it's all Christ. There's nothing you can do to please the Father. Now, does that mean we sin that grace abound? God forbid. How can we who are dead to sin live any longer there? What does that mean? That means that we live by the power of the Holy Spirit. He tells us what to do. He guides us. Just like with Adam when he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day with God. He had no law. So I'll leave it at that. Right. Okay. You can have it, but I got one point to say, and I do want to say this. When, when when I, and, and I know a couple people say this too as well, but when I speak of 
Sabbath and when I speak of the law, we're speaking of the spirit of the law. And I, what I see from the Old Testament, hey, Ron, you're supposed to be up here, sir. <laughs> I see him in the chat. But um, but when I look at it, I look at it from a standpoint of when it said it goes from the letter to the spirit. That's the transition. When you receive the Holy Spirit, that's what the problem was with the Most High God and Israel was because they were trying to do things out of flesh and self-gratification. That's why he got on them about going and praying in the street because they were praying for people to give them praise and not give the Most High praise. So when I when I look at it now, I think of it as a standpoint of I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. And if I do practice the Sabbath and keep it close to my heart, it's because I love God. I love Yah. I love his son. So when I do these things, Christ says, do these things in remembrance of him. So every time I do something, if it be Sabbath, if it be a feast day, no longer am I looking at doing things by the tablet, but I'm doing things by the spirit and I'm doing these things in remembrance of Christ. So that's my point. All right. Um, just wanted to chime in. Um, uh, it's so much I can say. I'm not going to hog up the time here. First, I want to just go to a key verse uh, that Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19. He said, the circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let me read that again. This is Apostle Paul. He said, the circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God or Allah Hayim or Yahweh, depending on, on however we want to pronounce it. Um, there's so many th different ways I could respond to this, but I wanted I wanted to start off with that because that is important, right? Um, in Hebrew, one of the key words that transliterates to the word commandment is dabar, right? Dabar. And when you see the Ten Commandments, right? Ashar dabar yam, right? Plurality, right? So um, inside the Ark of the Covenant, right, the Ark represented a, a physical presence of the Most High among the people. But we could take it a step further. It also represented the word dwelling among the people. Right. So when we look at that and understand that Dabar, the Shabbat, the commandment of the Shabbat is a actual commandment that was also contained inside the Ark of the Covenant. Inside what is called the Ark of um, some call it the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, which represent represented the physical presence of the Most High and His Word dwelling among them. Now, when we go to John one and one, guess what we say? Uh, we see it says what in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was uh, was with God, and the Word was God, right? But it did, but it goes on to tell us that the Word be, um, became flesh to what dwell among us, right? So we see that. Um, you know, the Hebrew Israelite Messiah, guess what? He he was the manifestation of Yah's word. Now, let's go even further with this, because when we see um, when we um, look at the honoring of the Shabbat, right, it's a number of things we could bring up. You know, when we say that, hey, there was no Shab no commandment of the Shabbat and all these different things from the very beginning. Guess what? We could go right back to we could deal with that. But another before I get to that, I want to deal with one thing real quick. Israel was not in. Um, their promised land when they were given the commandments. Israel was in the desert. They were not in the, they were not in, um, they were not in their promised land, right? They were, they, they were in the desert for what, 40, 40 years, right? Another case in point, when the Hebrew Israelite Messiah walked this earth, Israel was in captivity in their homeland to who? The Romans. So I just want to put things in this proper perspective when we when we when we mention those things. So when we get to the Shabbat, right, when we start dealing with Adam, right? As a matter of fact, let's deal with Noah real quick. And I'm going to get to Adam uh, because the Bible do say that the most high walk with uh, Adam at the cool of the day. So we know that there was conversations, there was discussions that was there. OK, perfect example. When we get to Noah, the scripture says that uh uh, Noah's son, uh, Ham, right, um, saw the what? Nakedness of his father. Well, when you go to Leviticus, I believe chapter 19, and you see the nakedness of the father is what? The wife. That tells us that Ham had an inappropriate relationship with his mother and produced what is called a bastard seed, right? Uh, uh, a bastard seed is someone that's born out of incest, right? But we see that what? Noah 
then curse Ham. He cursed what? The seed. Where did he get that from? Right. But, we, you know, it, it, you know, the most high. Right. We don't see anything uh, written at that time uh, about the uh, law of, you know, incest. But again, when we take it all the way back to the beginning, we see that uh, Adam's sons, they did the burnt offerings. <laughs> they were doing burnt offerings. How did they get that information? You know, when we start really understanding this, it's more to what we see and what we say, like, um, you know, the most high walk with Adam. So, you know, he expressed things to Adam that 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 that, uh, um, for example, that Adam handed down to his two sons. All right. Now, uh, another point, you know, Matthew chapter 12, when we start understanding what was happening in that scripture, right, the Pharisees was trying to take the law of harvesting and apply it to getting something to eat. That was the issue right there. He, they were trying to say, look, your disciple took a piece of corn to get something to eat, you know, but really what they were doing was trying to take the law of harvesting, not the, and, and, and um, enforce it as if it's the, as if the disciples were doing that very thing. So again, we have to put it in, when we put it in this proper perspective, you know, we see that, guess what? We can't obey the law. And the Hebrew Israelite Messiah made it clear, right? He made it clear, if you love me, right, keep my commandments. Well, that commandments is not just loving one another. Why? Because if we just say love one, one, one another and love the most high with no criteria, then we'll be lost. We'll start in injecting our own uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions to it. Right. So he gave him what? When we start confirming what he mean by that. Right. We'll see what happens in Matthew chapter 22. When you get down towards the end of that, he says what? Love Yah first. Number one, love each other. He said all the law and the prophets is, it hangs on these two things. It's going to teach you those key principles. So, again, you know, when you get back to it, when you look at the scriptures and I understand uh, even what um, Elder Holloway, uh, Holloway had hit a key point. He said that what? That um, the Shabbat, right, uh, always been the seventh day, right? We do know that Constantine changed that day. Constantine changed that day in 321 AD, right? Not only did he change that day, what did he also do that was um, that also of, um, that's part of the signs of the Shabbat? He changed the day that you actually honor, uh, acknowledge rather, the death of the Hebrew Israelite Messiah which I can prove that 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 his death occurred in the midst in the middle of the week. That's the prophecy in the midst. The middle of the week is Wednesday. Right. So that means that what um, by you changing that day, you actually change one of the key signs, one of the greatest signs that we were given that's associated with the Shabbat. And that's the that's the resurrection of the Hebrew Israelite Messiah. So Apostle Paul made it clear if he said that, guess what? Circumcision doesn't matter. Uncircumcision doesn't matter. But I, but keeping the commandments of Yah is what's important to it. Then we have to take that and then start what building on, on that right there. Right. Because, again, the Hebrew Israelite Messiah, when you read Matthew chapter five, he's not doing away with the law. He's actually fulfilling Jeremiah 31 when he said he's going to place his laws inside the heart. Because when you read Matthew chapter five, you see the Hebrew Israelite Messiah make reference to Torah because he said it's written of old, it's written this. But then he said, but I say unto you, he, he, he referenced to adultery. Then he said, hey, but I say to you, though um, that person who even look at someone, you already committed the law. What is that doing? Changing what? Our heart. So, again, when we start and, and, and uh, when we when we deal with. The writings of Apostle Paul, you know, um, the writings of the disciples, we have to do what? Just like Deuteronomy chapter, I believe, chapter 17, uh, either 16 or 17 tells us uh, um, two or three witnesses. So we should be able to confirm what Apostle Paul, uh, the, what many are interpreting of Apostle Paul with the other disciples. Yeah. Not just with Apostle Paul. So I just wanted to make that point. And, and, and you know, we got more time to discuss this, but I just want to put those on uh, a couple of scriptures out there. And, and then we can build on some of the other narratives on it. But I want to say that again. What is Apostle Paul referring to when he says circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing? But the keeping of the commandments of Yahweh is what he said. That's what's important is keeping his commandments. 
And the, the issue is when we deal with the Pharisees, it's the issue of what? Them adding their own stuff to it. You know, he took the law of what, uh, um, you know, about the, you know, if someone is unclean and having this on um, their blood is, you know, with their blood and, you know, discharges and things like that. You know, they took that law of, the, you know, the priest washing their hands, you know, when they end on uh, 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 doing burnt offerings and things along that line. And they made it into what uh, 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 their traditions and, and pushing it as if it was law telling, hey, you know, your disciples not washing their hands. You know, wait a minute, that water is not going all the way down to the tip of your elbows. See, that's what the Pharisees were doing. And in Matthew chapter 12, the Hebrew Israelite Messiah is addressing what the Pharisees are what taking something that's, for example, uh, the law of harvest and trying to push that as if it's, it's, a, it's unlawful getting something to eat. OK, thank you. Thank you. So who's next? Uh, I ask everybody who's next. I think when says she's next. Dr. Janet, and then after that, Elder Halloway, do you have something as well? Okay, so we'll start with uh, uh, Pastor Renee. Okay, yes, all. So real quick, I only have two points. Listen, Pastor Kelly be going in, boy, y'all good. This is what I want to say. <laughs> Listen, I'm like uh, my sister over there, Dr. Janet. I'm the laugher, so we're going to shake it up. Listen, it got serious and tough. Yeah. Um, I wanted to re uh, reiterate two things. Elder Holloway said something that was important. And it's interesting because I literally have just was teaching um, our assembly on this today. And he brought up the two main points that I spoke to them about. Context of scripture is very important. And first of all, I wanted to uh, publicly say to you, it's amazing. I've never heard a um, Christian, you know, say that. Well, we know the true Sabbath is on this on a um, Saturday like that. I was like, what? I mean, because to me, like it's you can Google these. Some of these things we could just it's not hard. So um, I wanted to say that. But when you said about the law, I am going to be very honest to say, number one, when you try, you know, it goes to priesthood. Y'all help me out. Uh, Y'all just help me. I'm just throwing these out here. I ain't the scholar. So just help me out. All right. When you talk about and I had to learn this as well, because when you dummy it down. I always tell people, talk to me like I'm two. The key is really what is the law? Like what is sin? What's the law? So the biblical definition of sin from 1 John 3, 4 is transgressing the law, missing the mark, not being able to live up to the letter of the law. Absolutely clear. When we start saying, you know, what's sin? You know, most people say, well, it's adultery, lying, you know, cheating, killing, stealing. That's categories of, of it, categories of sin. But what is truly sin? It's transgressing the law. So when you, the point that you made about um, from the beginning and then moving forward to the letter to the spirit, I absolutely agree with you that we have to be careful not to become legalistic and ritualistic because I will absolutely admit to everybody right here. Yes, I've been awakened to this truth. It's been about 10 years. This is a process. Number one, that's why when everybody comes into this awakening and I teach my assembly this, stop labeling stuff. Sometimes you got to stop putting labels on things because we miss the bigger picture. Um, like I, you know, it, you know, labeling certain things. So my thing is, when I understand what law is, the letter of the law, you have to have, it's simple to me in the sense where I have to have something to read to get the information to even know what to do and not to do. That's the letter of the law. And so moving to the spirit, as Pastor Kelly said, being circumcised, even for me, I've had to really evaluate how I was honoring the Shabbat because then I understood in reading the scripture, I'm going to just, because Pastor Kelly hit the scriptures, I was going to say, Matthew, listen, the Jewish side inserted the traditions of men. So they took the Torah, added to the Torah. And even for us, there are people that won't drive on the Sabbath. That's not in Torah. There are people that won't do certain things that is legalistic. So you always have to allow, that's the spirit of it, to be geared by the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit will lead in God to say, hey, 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 wait, where is that in the word? If it's not in the beginning, meaning if it's not in the blueprint that we have a guide to go back and refer to, then we should not do it. Because understanding the 
the spirit of the law is understanding that there's liberty behind the spirit. There is a liberty and a freedom and it's not bondage. The Bible says to keep the law is not grievous. It's not burdensome. When you try to keep it and it goes to meet your priesthood, we are not following the priesthood, right? Of the Levites leaning the letter of the law. We're now under the priesthood of Melchizedek who our Messiah came after. And so the law in the spiritual side, basically it magnified that even our thoughts, our intentions and our motives come into play as Pastor Kelly said. So when you also, and one last point I'm gonna use as well, um, the Romans that you used about, you know, be fully persuaded in your mind. Well, in the context of that scripture being fully persuaded in your mind is, and I'll use this example because it was talking about vegetarian and those that eat meat. Listen, if I decide to be a vegetarian and you don't decide to be vegetarian and you want to eat meat, guess what? That's your conviction. I can't impose my conviction on your conviction, you know what I'm saying, on what you gear geared is right and say that it's right or wrong. I think that's why when it comes to the spiritual side of being Torah observers, that you're led by the spirit because what may be pleasurable to me, meaning resting, may not be that same way for someone else. And I think that scripture was just saying, be fully persuaded in your mind that you are sure that what you do is what the Holy Spirit is leading God and you to do. Why? Because the blueprint just never changed. The new covenant is not new as in brand new. And all of a sudden it just erased what was there. No, the new covenant was a readjusting or a renegotiation of the contract of what was originally established because the letter of the law does kill it. The letter of the law, we could not fulfill it, but the grace came so that when we Miss the mark, not by willful sin, according to Hebrews, right? Because the Bible says when you willfully sin, there's no grace that cover you. So when you know to do wrong, grace is not covering you. So we can't abuse grace, but that when we miss the mark in trying to keep, which is why we should pray for sins of omission and commission. None of us know every single thing that's in Torah that we do that's right or wrong. That's why you pray and ask the father to forgive you and bring to your remembrance or knowledge what there is, right? And so we just have to balance those things out to understand that we can't do it by our own. Hey, sister, can I just say something real quick, real quick? And I, I see my brother, Divine Prospect, want to say peace and blessings to my brother, man. I mean, he's like, man, I'm telling you, man, I don't know how you do it, um, 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 Elder. I mean, you just, man, you go, you got you got Duracell beat, you know what I mean? You, you know, just to, you know, but I really appreciate you because you're definitely maximizing, your, you know, the youth of being able to do so much at that time. So I really appreciate all what you do. Um, just real quick to, um, to touch on what Pastor Renice had pointed out when we talk about the order of Melchizedek. Right. That's what that's what Hebrews make it clear that um, the Hebrew Israelite Messiah. And the reason why I'm saying Hebrew Israelite Messiah versus saying Christ is because some people forget that he was a Hebrew Israelite. So I make it a point to say that just to remind people that he's a descendant of Israel and that he was Hebrew. So I say that I, I, I put it in that context. But when we look at the order of Melchizedek. Right. Um, and we're under the order of Melchizedek, right? And says, uh, and we we make it. It makes it clear that the Hebrew Israelite Messiah is 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 the uh, under uh, what bringing back the what the order of Melchizedek. Well, through his example, he honored the Shabbat. Through the through his example, he gave us what the template on how to properly honor the law, statutes, and commandments. Right? Not in the way that the Pharisees were doing, but as his template. Right. And so when we understand that he honored, he honored the law, he honored the statutes. In other words, the instructions given on how to um, take uh, accomplish that. And so last point, when you look at Luke chapter one or Luke chapter two, I believe I believe it's Luke one. It says Zechariah and his wife said that they were blameless, said that they were blameless because a lot of times we take the narrative of what well, is impossible to uh, uh, honor all the laws. Well, in the, in the United States, there's over uh, 5,000 federal laws and 40,000, 40 to 40, 50,000 statues on how to carry out that law. So when we understand that, when we say that, you know, it's as if we're saying that Yah, Yah, Yah is flawed with his laws. Certain things don't apply to us. If somebody broke the law, it's I'm not the one 
to go and say, hey, I'm a I'm a I'm a pass punish. I mean, judgment on you because there were certain people that was designated to be able to what um, take out capital punishment. None of us can just come up and say, hey, you know what, divine prospect, you know what, I saw you standing next to, I mean, in front of that seafood place, and I'm going to make the assumption that you had some seafood. Uh, I, I, matter of fact, I bet not even do that because you know how people start attaching stuff. Like, let me just pull that back. I'm sorry about that. Well, let, me, let me give another example. But you know what I mean? What I'm getting at is I can't take it upon myself and say that I'm going to uh, um, uh, take out the, the, you know, um, the capital punishment on him. There were people set aside to do that. And there was a process to doing that. So that's some of the things that we hear a lot that, hey, if we're if, if we're under the law, how come you're not killing somebody that 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 broke the law? That's not my responsibility, you know, because then we start getting into what happened during the time the, the, um, the, the, um, the law on um, the patrols. Right. Um, when we start looking at the law, of the patrols, you know, when they started chasing or trying to catch slaves that ran away, they empowered every single person, every Caucasian to be able to do what? Capture the slave and punish that slave. So, no, that's not, we don't, we, we don't have that liberty to be able to say that, you know what, if I see a brother or sister doing something wrong, then I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, pass judgment and I'm going to inflict the penalties to that. So uh, I, I'll jump out of here. I know um, my brother, Devon Prosser, and I, I apologize for it. Guys, th don't take that example, you know, out of context. I am so, so I apologize, Devon, because you know how people would they'll take the littlest thing and chop it up into a video. And it's viral. Hey, look, Pastor Keller said that Devon Prospect is eating seafood. You know, I want to I want to just pull that back right now. So I apologize for even using that analogy. Okay, so the next, let's make sure we keep it under two minutes. I know all of us got points. Let's just make sure we do that. So I'm going to start with Dr. Janet. I'm going to let Michael Halloway, Dr. Halloway come in, Elder Halloway come in, and then Divine Prospect will provide his insight. Now, what's going to happen is this. We're going to end up just talking about the uh, Sabbath. We're going to have to have a round two when it comes back to the feast days. So this is, didn't realize it was going to be this long, but it's going to be good. And I'm gonna have to schedule the next one, but let's let's proceed with uh, Dr. Janet first. Yeah. I want to piggyback off of something that Pastor Renee said, and also something that Elder Mike Holloway said that I absolutely agree with. First of all, what Pastor Renee said about the renewed law. It was renewed, not because he did it over again, but he had to come in and take out what the Pharisees and the Sadducees put in it so that it would be pure again, because they made it unpure and they made it their law. They made it what they wanted. So when Mashiach came, he came with a renewed law, meaning that he made what was first over again. He didn't bring in something new. Renewed means to restore to the original the original status or the original state. So that's what he did. And what I like about what Mike, uh, Elder Mike Holloway said was, how are you keeping the Shabbat? How are you doing it? And so when we look at Isaiah 58 and 13, it says, if you do turn back your foot from the Sabbath, if you do not turn back your foot from the Sabbath for doing your pleasure on my set apart day and shall call the Shabbat a delight, the set apart day of Yahweh esteemed and shall esteem it not doing your own thing, your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in Yahweh, and I shall cause you to ride on the heights of the earth and feed you with the inheritance of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken this. Now, this is the prophet Isaiah speaking that. And what you said, Elder Holloway, what you said, my dear brother, Yacoba, it's a pleasure to meet you and blessings to you, uh, brother Ron. We, th that's all in our heart as well. That's all in our heart. What you said about the spirit, we believe in the spirit of the word. We believe in the spirit of the word, just like you all believe in the spirit of the word. But we also believe that there is a certain way to keep that seventh day. And it's not, there's nothing wrong. You are prohibited to do good on the seventh day. Mashiach killed that woman on the seventh day. He said, how can you be hypocrites and you go and you loose your, your animals, but you don't want me to heal this person. So we believe in doing good on the Shabbat. We believe in doing his pleasure and not our own delight and what we desire and what we feel the Shabbat is, and we, you know, like Elder Pernice, Pastor Pernice said, we got the Ruach. We have the Ruach HaKadosh, and the Ruach HaKadosh is going to lead us into all truth if we allow the Ruach to lead us. So in saying that, we have to understand that uh, when it comes to the Shabbat, we say that uh, Mashiach is the Shabbat. Mashiach is the Word. The Word, and, and the Shabbat is inclusive in the Word. 
And so we are obeying, we are obeying the word of Yah. We are keeping his commandments. It says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is what he says to, to us. And he says that the scriptures are hinged upon the word love. Listen, the law came about because of love. It didn't come about because he wanted to chastise and he hated his people. The law came about because of the love that Mashiach, that Most High had for his people. And Mashiach is the fulfillment of the law. He's not just He's just not the spirit of it. He's the fulfillment of law, but he is the word in completion. He is the word manifested in the flesh. He is the only begotten son of the father. So that means they cut a piece. It's just like going into a mountain, taking a piece of that mountain out and presenting it to the people. It's still the same mountain. It's the same mountain. It came from the same mountain. It's, it has the same DNA, has the same structure, has the same minerals as that mountain. So we need to understand as a people, when they come to Shabbat, we are arguing over things that we should not even be disagreeing with if we really sit down and look at the word and really study the etymology of the word and what's really being said about the word, even the language that the word was spoken in before the transliteration. Because there's a lot of transliteration that makes us have to go back to the original to understand clearly what is being said and even the customs of those days. So I just want to repeat, and I'm done, that uh, what Pastor Renee said is so true. He, re he came and he restored what was original, be, uh, aside from what man had implemented it. And then it's no longer the law of Yah. It's the law of man. Amen? When man comes in and change something, it's no longer what Yah said. It's what the man said or what the woman said. That's like maybe Pastor Kelly setting up an establishment in his house. At 9 o'clock, everyone has to go to bed because when you go to bed at 9 o'clock, you have a certain amount of hours that you, you can rest in and the rest is good for the body. And then someone comes in and says, you know what? We're going to say at 9 o'clock you can go to bed, but at seven, but at 10 o'clock you can get up and go eat something and then go back to bed at 11 o'clock. That's breaking the sleep, and it's no longer the law that Pastor Kelly gave, but it is an amendment to the law. There is no amendment to the law, none at all. Now, he did away with the ordinances. He did away with the killing of the sheep and all of that, but there is no amendment to the law of y'all when he tells us that we need to rest, that the Shabbat is on the seventh day, and we need to honor that Shabbat. Pastor Kelly, I was in the military. And when the general walked by in the hall, if you didn't salute that general, if you didn't salute him and honor and respect his rank, you got an Article 15. Our Article 15 means that you you get busted down to another rank, and you could even go to jail if it's if it, it's a level of disrespect where they have to put you in jail. You can go to Levensworth. So the the law the the Shabbat is a sign, like Pastor Prini said. And it's a sign of honoring him. He said, and then you should delight yourself in Yahweh. That means you should honor you. You're honoring me. You are delighting yourself in me by keeping my Shabbat. But it's how you keep it, like Pastor, like Elder Holloway said. There's a lot of legalism in a lot of people. One man told me he does not drive on the Shabbat. Well, guess what? I drive on the Shabbat. I have to. If, I, if I'm going to get to the, to the fellowship to teach, I got to drive. Another said that, um, now I'm going to tell you, I don't cook on the Shabbat. Some people don't cook on the Shabbat, or they don't spend any money on the Shabbat. But there comes a time, there is an exception where you may have to spend money on the Shabbat. You may have to cook on the Shabbat. Now, if you don't, I'm good. I'm glad for you. But there sometimes things happen where I have to maybe spend some money, or I might have to put some food on the stove or warm up something in a microwave. I'm sure that I'm not uh, desecrating the Shabbat. So I, I just wanted to say that's saw my sister's finger go up. <laughs> Pray yeah, no, 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 no. All no, well. I, that's just what I wanted to share. That's all. <laughs> no, we did a great job. We just kind of hold it the back of the finger because I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> but I want to get some time in. So I said, let me go back to my old back. Just like, excuse me. <laughs> All right, All right. Well, All right. and blessings to my friend Divine What's Prospect. Going? Welcome. Uh, but let me jump in here and uh and deal with uh this. I think that I want to make something clear that it is there's nothing wrong with keeping the Sabbath day in terms of if that's the day you choose to worship. I think that the Israelites, even after the cross, from a cultural as well as a conscience standpoint, continue to keep Sabbath, even the apostles, right? But not command, right? So remember, there's a big difference from cultural or custom, conscience, but not command. We're not commanded under the new covenant to keep in the sense that they kept it within their land. We're not commanded to do that. And I'm going to show you something here because, again, the law 
uh, was the schoolmaster. So, yes, the commands of God, there's there's a big difference between the God's moral righteous laws. Right. And many of the mosaic ceremonial civil customs that they were given within their land. Right. God's moral righteous laws transcend dispensation. They transcend each epoch of time. That's why it was a, still a sin when Cain killed Abel, because murder is a righteous moral law that's transcendent in the very nature of who God is. It is he is holy. And those things transcend from Mosaic law to the covenant and commands of Christ. None of that changes. And this is why uh, the notion that some Christians and, and it could be with some, uh, but Bible Christians are antinomian. That's that's just not true. We follow the commands of Christ. Uh, and so I want to show something here. Notice in Genesis 26, verse number five. Uh, the Bible says this about Abraham. It says, Abraham obeyed me, speaking of God, and kept my charge, my commandments, watch this, my statutes and my laws. So somebody says, see, Mike, there it is. Abraham kept the commands of God. Absolutely he did. Which laws though? Mosaic? No. And I'm going to prove that to you right in the text. He kept God's righteous moral laws, which every person should do regardless of dispensation. We're no longer in the Mosaic dispensation. And I'll prove that. Deuteronomy chapter number five, verse number two. Watch this. The Lord God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Verse three. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, with all those of us alive here today. What were they talking about? The distinction between the righteous moral laws that were given to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the covenantal laws established with Israel as God made them a nation and placed them in their land. Pastor Richardson is correct in that the law was given while they were still in the wilderness, but it was to sanctify them as he prepared to bring them into the land. They had to be a law-abiding people before they could cast the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, and all the other ites out of the land. Remember, because if they disobeyed the law, then the land would spew them out also, which is exactly what happened because they didn't allow the land to rest on the Sabbath, then themselves didn't obey it. And even when they kept the outward customs because their heart wasn't right, uh, God, uh, God still said, you know what? Hold off on your sacrifices. I'm not pleased with any of them. And those things were within the law. But because remember, those things were the training wheels. They were the tutor, according to the scripture, the schoolmaster. Right. So it's not the righteous moral law that Christians are against. Not at all. Not Bible Christians anyway. Right. But the Bible Christian understands that I don't need training wheels anymore. I don't need God uh, uh, to tell me, make sure you sit down and worship me this day. Want to know why? Why? Because in my relationship with him, it transcends that which was given temporally in the land and ascends to me worshiping him on a daily basis. Now, watch what Paul says here and I'll, and I'll shut up here. <laughs> uh, watch what Paul says here in Galatians chapter number three. Because we keep talking about that, well, he was renewing what he gave before. That's true. But the problem is he wasn't renewing the Mosaic covenant. He was renewing the promise that he gave to our father Abraham before the Sabbath day was ever instituted as a command. Galatians chapter three, verse 17. Watch this. The what I am saying is this, Paul speaking, the law, watch this, which came 430 years later. So don't say that that law was in the beginning. No, it came 430 years later. And it does not, according to Paul, invalidate the covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. So Christ was always the promise. The schoolmaster, the law, pointed to Christ, prepared us for Christ. It's like being in elementary school uh, when you were in kindergarten and you learn how to write cursive on that green paper and write between the lines. Well, we don't write on that paper all the time. Well, nowadays they don't even write anymore, but we, you, you don't carry that into your adulthood. That was the schoolmaster. People who legalize the keeping of the law or the keeping of the Sabbath as a command not to be broken within the current dispensation, that's simply what we're doing. We're basically saying, no, nope, you got to keep going to lunch 
at 12. You got to stay in single file like you did in kindergarten. No, we're out of school. The schoolmaster is gone. Now through the spirit, the righteousness, according to Romans chapter number uh, eight, verse four, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who don't walk after the flesh, but after, I mean, uh, but after the spirit, right? It's not the letter of the law. It's the spirit. We don't, in those customs that guided us in those days no longer are necessary under this dispensation of grace because the spirit is primary, not the letter. All right. Well, even to your All point, right. I'm sorry, sister, you can say something. I don't want to hog you. All right. Did Ron get a chance to No, come he in? hasn't. He muted out as I saw mute. Oh, there you go. I'll, I'll I'm, yeah, I'm here, but go ahead. And and I, I, I'll let pass it. I, I just want to uh, add, can we get a little bit more control on the timing and stuff? Because I can't be up all night. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. So we got about, uh, make sure everybody stays within the two minutes. I'm sorry I had stepped away for a second okay. to let somebody go on, but this let's won't keep even it. 30 seconds. All now, right, I'm, I'm going to let Pastor <laughs> Kelly take two minutes. All right, all real quick. quick. One of the things we have to understand, and I gave the scripture where Paul said in Corinthians, circumcision and uncircumcision doesn't matter, but keeping the commandments of Yah. When we look at a part of the confusion that we have when we deal dealing with, for example, the covenants, we thinking that there's multiple covenants that was passed down. When we look at when we get to Noah, it says that what the most high established this covenant established does not mean make uh, new. It means to stabilize. And then from Noah to Abraham, we see the word again established that I will establish my covenant between you and your seed. All right. So when we, we, we have to understand that, you know, the covenant was already being handed down. But, I, I, you know, but the one thing that I want to point out is Paul's primary argument, because he said his ministry is based off of what? Uncircumcision. So when I highlight it, when he said nothing matters for us, uncircumcision and circumcision doesn't matter. But but the but keeping the commandments of Yah, why did he place the point of emphasis on circumcision? When you look at the book of Galatians, chapter two, he starts off with what after his salutation, he starts off with what the law of circumcision. You see that all through that 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 letter that. Apostle Paul wrote the law of circumcision. You'll see that all through his letters. You'll see even back in the book of Acts chapter 15, which confirms what Paul is saying in Galatians. He's dealing with the law of circumcision as the primary thing. Why? Because Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 30 that the most high was going to what? circumcise the hearts of Israel because he knew that they were going to need this. These laws to be what placed inside their heart. So we have to be careful when we say the law, for example, the term law, Moses, that was the term Joshua used, you know, but when we look at it, the law had different terms. So when we look at the covenant, you have the covenant and within the covenant, you have laws. And if you don't have any laws, then you just have a blank check. You cannot have a covenant without criteria, without an expectation or standards. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Sister E. Okay. So next we have Ron. Ron, do you have something? Ron Shields. I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, wow. I mean, uh, it was I witnessed a great show that's been going on for about an hour and some change. And um, there was a lot of things that were said, and I don't have a lot of time to address everything, so I won't. Um, but what I'll do with the little bit of time that I have is the first thing is it's always good to get context, right? Um, and Pastor uh Renice, what she was saying in regards to uh the book of Romans. Um, where we're talking about let every man be persuaded in his own mind. And when you read it for context, you see that it had to do with, like she said, meat and vegetables. Well, if you understand anything about ancient Rome, there are various things that were there that influenced uh, vegetarianism as well as in the uh, region of the Levant. Uh, in the area of Rome, the gladiators, right, who would war in the Roman Colosseums, uh, a lot of them had a vegetarian diet. Plato, right? And in his uh, one of his plays, he has a character called Socrates, and they speak about uh, the preeminence of vegetarianism because of the respect of uh, plants having souls just like animals and humans, right? Oh, excuse me, uh, animals having souls just like humans and plants are devoid of that, right? So they believe that it was good to eat plants or to consume plants so that you wouldn't take away the soul from the animal unrighteously, right? And then uh, Platoism had influence in early Christianity, right? So by the time Shaul Paul's getting to Rome, you already have people that are there in Rome who are not eating meat, 
right, who are avoiding meat because of philosophical reasons and other reasons like that. Well, when you get into the region of uh, Israel at that time, you'll see that you had the Nazarene sect themselves, um, even some Ebionites who also refrained from meat as well. Uh, they believed the meat was um, not set apart or not kodesh, what we call kosher today, um, because they believe it was unclean. So that way they withdrew themselves to certain areas on the fringes of society, set up their communities. One of them you see in the area of Qumran, um, and they abstained from meat, right? And they had a whole doctrine around that um, abstinence of meat. So understanding the background, you see now there's tensions in these groups in Ecclesia that's coming together where some are subscribing to vegetarian and some are still eating meat. And this becomes a big contention uh, in the Ecclesia. So what Shalom is saying is like, look, you know, for the sake of common good, you know, let every man be persuaded on the things that he is convicted in, right? So that is the context I just want to place it because it's always good to look at the background to understand what Paul is doing because we don't read anything that Paul received. We only read what he's sending, right? Um, the second thing I want to mention is um, Hebrews 4. It's a great scripture when it comes into that rest. And that rest that he's referring to there is the rest that Joshua could not give the children of Israel because he brought them into the promised land because even though the children of Israel were coming into the promised land, there was still a degree of disobedience. They still had to fight. There was still war. So they could not enter into that physical rest that they were promised because of things that they failed to do. Yet they said that Yeshua was coming to bring a spiritual rest. That's why he says that my burden is light and my yoke is easy, right? So he also came and gave that rest that we have, but that does not neglect the fact that the cultural mandate of the Sabbath was still established and it was not avoided. Yeshua rested, the disciples rested, the apostles rested. Matter of fact, they couldn't even go to the tomb of Yeshua until after the Sabbath, right? Because they were resting and keeping the Sabbath. So the Sabbath never went anywhere, right? The Sabbath was never, we, we, we didn't get any instructions that the Sabbath was done away with. Now there's some people who would uh, parse out the Ten Commandments and say, well, this is not you know, um, the Mosaic law, like this is just eternal law. That's the establishment. This is why they said this is why the two tablets are placed into the mercy seat, because that represents the foundational laws of the Most High's kingdom, irregardless of time, right? Or dispensations, if somebody wants to use that term. But one of those commandments, the fourth commandment is what? The Sabbath. So how come the fourth commandment is all of a sudden saying, oh, well, you know, this is not good anymore, but yet the other nine is, but yet we have no teachings from Shaul, no teachings from the apostles saying that the Sabbath is no longer something that they kept. Now, when it comes to Gentiles, that's a different story altogether, because now you have a discussion whether or not the Gentiles should subscribe to that or not. Now, the Gentiles decided they want to cleave and keep the Mosaic law, then they also would keep the Sabbath. But in regards to what was being taught by the apostles, they never taught that that cultural mandate that was inherent in their character as Israelites was ever done away with. And there's no text that can do away with that. And the last point I wanna make real quick is that um, my brother, um, um, my elder Michael Holloway, shout out to my brother, elder Michael Holloway, shout out to Sister E. I forgot to give the shout outs, Pastor Richardson in the building, Yakoba, Pastor Renice Kirkland, how you doing sis? Uh, Dr. Janet L. Howell, I got the new L, excuse me. I gotta give props to all my elders mm -hmm. on here because I think all of you are older than me. I'm not gonna mention your, your ages, all right? I'm gonna get nobody upset, but these are all my elders Ooh. on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> they may look look younger than me, but you know these are my elders. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so um, I, I just want to make this last point, um, just so that we can understand context, right? So uh, my uh, my brother, Elder Mike Holloway, who I have much respect for, we had a great dialogue a while ago on my platform, and it was he was one of the I would say the best Christian apologists I could talk to because he's reasonable, he has a good head on his shoulders, and he's willing to build. Right. He's not just there to argue. Um, but what I want to say is that he brought up Deuteronomy chapter five, which was interesting because it was talking about the covenant uh, that was made by the children of Israel um, on uh, Mount Horeb. Right. So Moshe was talking about here, Israel, the statutes and ordinances that I clear in your hearing this day. Learn them and observe them carefully. Uh, Power made a covenant with us at Horeb. He did not make this covenant with our fathers but with all of us who are alive here today. Then it says, Yodhewave spoke with you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. So this is all inclusive of that covenant, right? Horeb being the location, because this is them being brought out of Misraim, whereas the covenant made with the forefathers led them into Misraim to give the period of time 
for the cinema Amorites to be full so they can be judged. And that's at the same time when he's pulling them out, right? So now we have him, Moshe, being called the statutes and ordinances. He's specific. He didn't say statutes, laws, commands, judgments. He just said statutes and ordinances, which means that you have some additions to a covenant. Remember, there was more than one covenant, two covenant, three covenant. Every time the Israelites disobeyed and the Most High went to go and rescue them, they made a covenant that they will keep the things that was agreed upon at Mount Sinai, or in this case, at Mount Horeb, which is the same location. But what's interesting is if you go to Genesis chapter 26 and verse 5, we see something that's very antiquated, something that's much older than that, right? I'm going to read it for you real quick, and then I'm done. Uh, Genesis 26 and 5. Uh, well, I'll read, I'll read uh, three for context. It says, so join in this land. This is the most High speaking to Isaac, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath that I swore to your Abraham, your father. So now he's coming into covenant with the Most High. So it was one already pre-existing with Moshe, but now he's coming into covenant with Isaac. And then he will also come into con uh, covenant with uh, Jacob. And then he will also come into covenant with Yosef. And he will also. So he's continuously establishing. And every time he establishes this covenant or renews the establishment of a pre-existing covenant, there's things that are added because different things have taken place. But listen to this. Watch this. It says, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to them your offspring, all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Verse five, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Now, wait a second. You got to back up for a second and say, hold on. I thought that it was only through Moshe that we had these ordinances and these statutes. But he's saying here that Abraham obeyed his voice and kept his charge. Now, if you go back into the Hebrew and read it, you'll see the word Torah is there because he kept the instructions that the Most High gave him, which became custom. Watch this. I'm going to explain to you how this works. When you go back and look at what happened with the children of Israel, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to say children of Abraham, you'll see that certain situations happen that you can only understand that it was wrong if there was customary statutes, laws, and commandments. A great example is that any form of rape was condoned. Liverite marriages was expected to be performed by Onan. Where did this stuff come from? Cleaning unclean animals. How did Abraham know what animals was clean and unclean in order to give sacrifice? These things were already customary in the culture before they became codified for a theocratic establishment in the land. That's the only difference between it. One was custom. The other one became a theocratic establishment for their rule in the land under the sovereign reign of the Most High. These things have already predated Moshe before he even got here. And if you read better sheet or Genesis, you'll see the laws playing out in various areas. Like, wait, how did they know this was wrong? Wait, how did they know this was wrong? Wait. It's because they already had this in their customs. So the Sabbath was something that was already in their customs because when you read Exodus chapter 20, what does it relate the Sabbath back to? The resting of the Most High. If you go before Exodus 20 to Exodus 16, you get the establishment of what? Of the Sabbath. Before Exodus 20, it pre-existed the Ten Commandments being established. All it did was codify what was already there and what Yah already expected from his people. So I just want to put that in context that when we read and understand this, part of the Ten Commandments, as far as the Sabbath, was never something that the apostles taught against, Yeshua taught against, and it was never expected that Israelites would ever break the Sabbath or say it was null and void. I'm done. Oh, uh, so let's go ahead. We're gonna have to. Anybody else got other points? So this is your code, by uh, I think it's my turn. Yes. Okay. Right. So what I like to say is. You know, first of all, that there is such a thing as a new covenant. It's not a renewed covenant. Also, I like to say is that, uh, you know, we need to make the distinction between Old Testament law and the new law that Christ gave. Because everyone wants to ignore the fact that Christ gave us a new law. What is that new law? That new law is the law of love. Now, we say, what does that even mean? Right. It says in Romans 13 verses 8 through 10. Let no debt remaining outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. This is part of the 10. 
You shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So if we want to go back to the Old Testament law and ignore what Christ said himself, that there's a new law of love, we keep ignoring that because when Christ says, keep my commandments, everyone wants to jump, jump back to the Mosaic law. But Christ said there's a new law he gives you, which is a law of love. Paul clarifies what that means. And we see the list of the Ten Commandments there. And he says that that fulfills all of the law. Now, let's go all the way back. If we say we are keeping the Mosaic law and we're keeping those Old Testament laws, you can lie to me. And I'm not talking to you all. I'm just talking in general. You can lie to me, but I'm not going to lie to you. The point being is most of those laws had to do with people being in the land. You had to have a temple. You had to have a priesthood. Okay. Most of these laws that you say you're keeping, the feast days, all these things, you can't keep because there's no Levitical priesthood. There's no temple. But you tell me you're keeping the feast days. I don't believe it because you're not in the land. Okay. So we may need to make that distinction that those laws were for a people who lived in the land. Now, one, the other thing I, I want to list is, uh, is, Gal is Galatians. Is, Gal is Galatians chapter five. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, okay, we're dealing with the law here. If you, if you want to stay in context, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is Faith, expressing itself in love. Faith, faith is the new covenant. Faith is the new, the new currency that we have that pleases God because without faith, it's impossible to please him. Galatians chapter two, verses 19 to 21. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. See, this is the difference between you trying to keep the law in your own strength and Christ living out in you the keeping of the law. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness cometh by the law, then Christ died in vain or he's dead in vain. So we need to understand there's a difference between you and your ability to to please God through your efforts of keeping the law. Some of you all believe that we're lawless because we say we have grace. We're not saying we sin. We don't say we have a license to sin. What we're saying is that we live by the power of the Holy Spirit. We live like Adam did when he walked in the cool of the day because he knew no sin. The sin is for the lawless. Why is the sin for the lawless? Because they're going to be judged by it. But the one who walks by faith, he trusts in Christ. He lives and, and relies on the power of God so that when he does sin, he gets to repent. So here's the difference. When the law, when you broke the law under the Old Testament, you had to have a, a, a sacrifice. You had to have that paid for, right? There was no wiggle room. If you broke the law, you had to pay for it. If you broke one law, you broke them all. So now you have a difference here where Christ, the eternal lamb, the eternal sacrifice has paid an eternal price for you with his precious blood that now when you sin, you say, Father, I am sorry, please forgive me. And he says, you know what, son, I forgive you. Your sins are washed away because I paid the price. So if he does that, if there's grace, then grace says, you know what, the price I already paid so you don't have to pay it. Under the Old Testament law, if you broke it, you had to pay the price. You had to go get an animal sacrifice or you paid the price. Okay, Jeremiah 30, 31 says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. A new covenant, not a renewed covenant. Why is Christ make a new covenant? Because we needed a new covenant. 
because under the old covenant, we would not be made righteous. Under the old covenant, there was no grace. Under the old covenant, we had to pay the price or there had to be a final lamb, there had to be a lamb sacrifice. And the Bible says the blood of bulls and goats cannot save. So now we're under a new covenant under that order of Melchizedek. Why is it under the order of Melchizedek and not Moses? Because it's grace. It's a different type of law. It's a law of love. It's a law of grace and mercy. See, this is the different people don't understand. See, when you try to enter in those gates by yourself, thinking you please God, do your laws, your efforts of keeping that law, statutes, and commandments, you're not going to please him because he's saying, what you did with my son? He's saying, where's that faith? He says, I already paid the price. Now, the difference is people think when we say that is grace, that means I could do anything I want. No, 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 no. You're de dealing with a whole new dynamic now. The dynamic is how can we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? What does that even mean? It means that we who are born again of the spirit walk by the power and leading of the Holy Spirit. And so then he brings all things to our remembrance. If you think about doing something wrong, the Holy Spirit is going to correct you. And I'm going to give you an, an example of, of why when you say you think you're keeping the law that you're not. Because the scripture says, okay, Christ said, if you look at a woman as to lust under her, you have committed adultery. That's not written in the Old Testament about lusting in your heart. Okay. So there's other laws like that. Paul said, I see a law in my members. That when I want to do good, I can't. Now, you state that it was all, all the laws written on the tablets of stone. No, because when I want to do good, my flesh says, no, do bad. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Who? Christ. This is why we have Christ. This, this is why we submit ourselves to him and he leads us. That's why the law is for the wicked, because the wicked is going to be judged by what's written therein. But the, the self, those who are saved, those who are born again, are judged based upon faith in Christ. That doesn't mean you can do anything you want. So we need to understand the difference between law and the difference between grace. We not and the, and the laws when Christ said you keep my commandments, which commandments are he talking about? The commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, the commandment to love God, which fulfills all the law, or is he talking about the mosaic? All right. Can I respond to that? Okay. Okay. What can, I, can I say something real? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay, right. guys, so let's, wow. let's try to close. <laughs> Up and we have to reconvene with the conversation. I'm gonna give everybody 10 more minutes and we can. Re I know this is heated. I step away for a minute to go answer the door and I come back like, What happened? Please. Surely you didn't know with everybody on it was gonna be that fast. Surely no, you but knew that. I want Ron to go ahead because you know he, you know, he had the least amount of time. So I'm a, I'm a, you know, I can respond, but Ron, go ahead, do your thing, Ron. All right, All right, Sister E, do I have your permission, sis? Oh, gosh, yes. This is good. Come on. It's, it's your platform. I got to be respectful. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I plan on going live in like an hour or so. If y'all want to, if anybody still want to keep rolling, you got the after party coming up soon. I didn't even know y'all was having this discussion. I'm just grateful to be here amongst so many great, you know what I'm saying? Praise the most high, man. Um, so, uh, brother Yakoba, I don't, I don't know what your position is. Are you, are you a Christian, my brother? Brother Yakoba, you, I don't go by the identity of a Christian. I go by a believer in Christ, who's an Israelite. So, you are Israelite who subscribes to Christian doctrine, correct? Meaning that um, you believe that we're in the new covenant of Jesus through His blood, correct? Correct. Okay, good. All right. So I just wanted to respond to a couple of things. Um, uh, one thing that you that you mentioned, um, and again, this is just, you know, out of dialogue, right? Um, everybody here know my spirit, and I'm not here to contend or to argue anything, but I just wanted to counter some of the points that you made. Because some things that you say would be misleading um, if somebody is not studied in the time, right, or of Torah. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times people always say that love is a new law. Love is, has already been there in Torah. If you go to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, it says to love your neighbor. <laughs> There's nothing new that he's creating. So when, when we Did Christ people, say it was a new law or not? Hold on. Well, you said it was a new law because you said the new no, law. No, Christ said it's a new law. Christ okay. said that. All right, cool. So, but in what context? 
right? Because anytime he spoke in reference to the law, he also made a reference in the Psalms, he made a reference in Isaiah, a reference in Jeremiah, a reference in other places as well. So that loving your neighbor, the problem was the people got to a point where they were so integrated into society, they started to lose their way. So he had to remind them. So to them, it was new because this is something that was being removed through moral traditions that was laid in upon the people that he was speaking against. Love your neighbor has always been there. Grace, the Most High has always been gracious. If you go to the book of Exodus, when the Most High is passing through Moshe, he says his name, yod hey wife and yod the Lord is most merciful, most gracious. These are his qualities, his traits that he expected the Israelites to have as well. His grace and mercy has always been there. That we should have died for capital offenses that he committed, but it's because of the grace of the Most High that he skipped over that penalty. Grace has always been here. It has never came about because of a New Testament. It has always been here. Faith, you mentioned faith as well. Hebrews chapter 11 in New Testament scripture says that all the forefathers had faith and their faith is what justified them. This was before Yeshua even walked the scene. Faith was already going on. Even Abraham's faith and the obeying of the voice. That is how the faith the started. He heard the, the voice of God. Christ. OK, so so I'm going to I'm going to get there. All of this is the essence of Christ. So everything that we see that is happening in the Tanakh is the essence of Christ. Now it becomes embodied. And what he has to do is he has to reestablish things of old because of so many successes, captivities and integrations. And to other foreign nations, the people are beginning to lose their way. So these things sound brand new to him. The brother said about the adultery. If you look on a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Well, first of all, you can't commit adultery unless you're married. That's one and number two guess what if you look at the last commandment of the ten commandments it says do not covet your neighbor's wife wait hold on that's not committing the act that's something that's already done in the heart so what i'm simply saying is if you do not examine the tanakh and the torah for what is written read it within its historical context its cultural context its linguistic context and be able to extract these things you see that these things are axioms that it was already pervasive through the lineage of the people who will be called God's people or Yah's people. This stuff has already been there. All he was doing was codifying it and pulling out the weightier matters. Last point, he was speaking to the Pharisees and saying, you guys, time, come in and many all these things, but you've missed the weightier matters of the law. You go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, it says, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Psalm 51, where David were praying, he said, look, I would give you bulls and goats, but what you require is a broken heart. Broken and contrite. So Paul heart. says oh, that the wait, law wait, was wait, our wait, schoolmaster. Hold on, hold on. What I'm simply saying is all of these things we find in the New Testament. I'm this not going to disagree with that, but you got to keep it in context. And I am okay? keeping it in context. Now, now you got to understand that Paul said that the, the, the law was our schoolmaster. Why? Because we did we needed to learn that we could not keep the laws, right? Because he says, if you offend in one, you offend that in all. So we were not perfect like Christ is perfect. Mm -hmm. So God requires perfection. And because he required perfection, he had a perfect sacrifice, which is his son, who was able to keep perfect a perfect law. So now that we have a faith in Christ and someone who was able to keep the perfect law, now by faith in him, we keep the perfect law. Let me ask that you a is question. the difference. Did Yeshua keep all the statute laws commandments? Yes or no? All the statute laws? Yeah, of course he, he did because he fulfilled all the laws. Wait, he can't keep all of them because some of them don't even pertain to him. Well, he was the final sacrifice, right? He, he, he right? He didn't buy them in other law, right? Did not Christ keep the Sabbath day because he's the Lord of the Sabbath, right? So how do you say that? How do you say he so, did? So, so did he break the Sabbath? What when he went out there and uh in the grains with his uh people? Did he, did the, he according to the Pharisees, but according to him, since he's wait, hold on. Because okay. he's God, because he's God in the flesh, he is Lord of the Sabbath, so he cannot break the Sabbath because so, so he is action, our Sabbath day rest. His he action, is our Bible, Sabbath rest. He's the action, fulfillment. Hold on. The Bible says that the that all of that was a shadow of things to come. What does that even mean? How is the law and all of these things that happen a shadow of the things that were going to come, which were going to be fulfilled in Christ? We got to understand that. 
Okay. So first I want to answer somebody in the chat. They said, show me in the Old Testament where it says, love thy neighbor. So go to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. I already put it out there, right? You can go back and you can read that for yourself to the person in the chat. And reg in regards to you, my brother, Yacoba, and again, I'm building with you. There's no debate, no argument. You know, I know you have limited time, but I would love to bring you on my platform so we can just talk about this ad infinitum, and that way we can build in more detail meticulously on these fine new or nuances that we're bringing out. So what I'm simply saying is the problem with the issue with the children of Israel from the time that Moshe brought the law to the people all the way to the time of Yeshua, you know how many years that was and how many events happened during that period of time? So many things happened during that period of time that we have to take account for to see why the people got to a point where they were and why Shaul had to say certain things to the people and even mostly the Gentiles who was his major audience. Remember, he's talking to the Gentiles. Galatians chapter two, he said the right hand of fellowship was given to him to go to who? The uncircumcised. So we have to so keep in mind who question? his audience. Hold on, my brother, because you said you're an Israelite. Who his audience is, that's number one. And number two, the point that I'm trying to say is that when Christians, and I'm not just saying you, and I'm just saying in general, when Christians say, well, every time you break the law, you got to give a sacrifice, that is untrue. And I don't know why people say that every time you break the law, you got to give a sacrifice. That is not true. Only people so who do not study saying, Torah say, oh, hold on, my brother. Only people that do not study Torah say those things because if you look at all do you, the do you keep the feast days yes or no yes i do i keep the feast days and i keep them as a memorial that's okay why then as a memorial so you don't keep it according to the law i do keep because it you're doing it as a memorial so so let me let me explain something to you my brother okay let me explain I, I, and i want to get too technical since we don't have a lot of time right when you look at exodus chapter uh 12 where it goes into the pasach or the passover laws you'll see things in there that you don't see in deuteronomy Things you see in Deuteronomy looks like there's things additional that you don't see in Exodus. Do you know why that's the case? Because in Exodus, when it was first given, where were they at? It was in Israel, right? There was an Egypt. And then by the time we get to Devarim, it's believed that this is the father of Moses, that that occurred right before they went into the promised land, right? But if you ask scholars, they'll say this is written close to the close to the post-exilic period. The point did I'm trying to say make you did it as memoriam, though. Did you not say that? Point. The point I'm trying yes to say. Yes or no? Say, yes or no? I said that to you, but the point yes, I'm trying right? to So if you did it as memoriam, so, you're not doing it as no, unto no. the law. You're are not they, are they, the are, they, are there any real Jews today that keep the law? Yes or no? That's not the point. The point is whether or not you're keeping the feast days according to the Old Testament laws. No, you're not. Okay. So tell me how I'm not, my brother. Because there's no temple. There's no Levitical priesthood. So I need You're not in the Passover. land. Wait, wait, wait. So I need a temple for Passover. Show me why I need a temple for Passover. I'll no, wait. you said you're keeping the feast days. That means unleavened bread, all it's of that, right? Are you, bread are, you not, are, you, are you not keeping the feast of unleavened bread? Oh, you said Passover you're keeping the feast. It's you Passover just told me that. Yes, sir. It's Passover and unleavened bread part of the feast days, yes or no? Yes. And if it is, do I need a temple or do I need a priest in order to do that? No, you need a temple. You need a sacrifice. I mean, Exodus 12. Yes, no. My brother, my brother, my brother. Show me in Exodus chapter 12 where I need a temple and a sacrifice in order for me to keep the Passover. That's all I'm asking you, my brother. Show that to me, please. Hey, Ron, while, while he's looking at that, can I just mention one scripture real quick? Oh, while sure. he's getting that? All right. No, because I, I, I don't want to interrupt you guys thought. But just to that point, when um, Luke chapter one, verse five and six says there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia. And his wife was a, of the daughter of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they both were righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now, I, I just need to understand that scripture right there since, since no one, it's impossible to honor the law, but we have two people here that said that they honored all, not certain ones. They said all. I, I just want to, I, I want to, you know, if you can explain that text to me, 
guess what? I, you know, I'll, I'll, ch I'll change. You know what I mean? If you could tell me what that text actually means, if it's, if it's saying that, no, it's what well, they was doing this portion of it. No, it said all. Okay. So yeah. So let me make sure when you get done, I know pastor uh, elder Halloway, this is heated y'all. I'm sitting here now scratching. I'm like Marie now I'm scratching my head. Uh, <laughs> elder Halloway, you proceed. And, um, uh, if anybody else have anything else, let's 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 go ahead and wrap this up. Ron, I'm okay. going to but let me yeah. let so say, that way, yeah, I was just, I was gonna say to Brother Yakoba if if he can respond after that and I'll give my final piece. But I also want people to know that we also have to look at extra biblical data when it comes to the feast because when the Israelites were in captivity in the realm of the Persian rule in Elephantine Island, you have the Passover letter that's in the Elephantine papyri. And if you go and read that, guess what they were doing? They were keeping the Passover. All which had to do was go and sync with what was being done in Jerusalem. And there was no way in their mind they said, hey, we got to go and make Aaliyah to Jerusalem in order to keep this Passover. That's not the case. They only wanted instructions to be in sync for what was already being done in Jerusalem. They didn't say we have to go there and do it. So that means something happened. Of the text that commanded people that you have to go and make this pilgrimage there in order for you to keep the Passover the way it was intended. But extra biblically, Israelites was all over keeping these feast days, and we have evidence of that. Why would they do that if they had the Torah and they understood that they couldn't do that? That's it. I'm done. That's it. I'm, done. I'm, I'm shut up. You get it, Elder, Elder Mike, because I know you want to go in. So I'm gonna yes. let Elder Mike go in. <laughs> this is fun, man. I appreciate everyone. This is this is good. I, I'm enjoying this. But I want to just real quick, I want to I just kind of want to respond to uh Pastor Richardson. He just talked about how both Elizabeth and Zacharias kept the law perfectly. And I believe the text. I'm a Bible man. And so if the scripture says it, I believe it. Because within the law, and I think uh Divine Prospect alluded to this, within the law, there was a measure of grace. Uh, I don't think anyone here, I don't think anyone here, when we read that uh, uh, Elizabeth and Zacharias kept the law perfectly, I don't think any of us think that means sinless perfection, like they never sinned. Like none of us would think that because the scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But within the law, through the Levitical priesthood and other things, there were provisions such as the Day of Atonement and other sacrifices that were, as uh, uh, Divine Prostate brought, brought, brought out, within their culture, within the system that they could practice and God would still count them righteous, though they were not sinlessly perfect. Paul said that concerning the law, he was blameless. But it was the same Paul in Romans chapter number seven who said that the law brought death to me because when I sought to do good, evil was always present. But how can you, Paul, confess that you are a wretched because the law brought death and at the same time in another chapter say that you were blameless because Paul still kept the customs of the law, which those within those customs, God accepted them because uh, uh, those things God used to count them righteous. Again, they were temporary. Now we all can have opinions, we all can have feelings and things like that, but the text has got to be the authority, the biblical text. And, and, and here's what the Bible says, and we'll make it absolutely clear and I'll be quiet. Uh, oh, and I just wanted to hit real quick before I go to the other text, the verse that that uh, uh, Brian was asking about. Well, the scripture does say three times a year you shall all your males are to appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. We know that the pilgrimage feast included Passover. And so, yes, there was a biblical command to bring your sons to the temple on Passover. Yes, prior to Exodus chapter number 20, they kept it within Egypt, right? And God gave them that, but God established in the law that that had to be done at the temple. And listen, I'm with you, Cole. You're not keeping, you're not keeping Passover according to the law. Now, I'm, I'm not against. If people say you want to keep it as a memorial, more power to you, right? Just don't for one moment think that it adds any measure of righteousness to you than, than other than outside of having faith in Jesus Christ. But this is the verse I wanted to go through, go to real quick in the book of Galatians. And uh, my brother Yacob kind of alluded to this verse, but I want to, let's let the scriptures do the talking and, and everything else, uh, you know, all our opinions can go to the wayside. Now it says here, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. It does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ. What I am saying is this, the law, 
brought this out earlier, which came 430 years later. I agree with Divine Prospect that there were customs that the law gravitated to that were within their culture before Exodus chapter 20. I agree, but not all. You can't say that because again, according to the Apostle Paul, the law did not come till 430 years later. Right. And it didn't it, val it didn't invalidate the covenant previously ratified. Watch this. Verse 18. For if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Why then the law? So in other words, why did he give us the law then? Well, it was added. Notice it was added, not something that always was. It was added because of their transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed who uh, who would come to whom the promise had been made. Now, I'm just going to jump down and I'll be done here. Verse 21, is the law contrary to the promise of God? God forbid, may it never be. For if a law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. So it, righteousness would have been based on the law. It's not based on the law now, but the scriptures has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Verse 23, but before faith came, I agree there was always faith. Abraham had faith. But now we're talking about the covenant that is ratified in Christ's coming. Yes, Abraham had faith. I believe David had faith. Yes, the old covenant people had faith. Hebrews 11 gives us a chapter of old covenant people with faith. But they were not under the dispensation or covenant of grace as we are today. Because Paul says, before faith came. We can't erase that. We were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Remember, the law is the tutor so that we may be justified, not by the law, but by faith. But now that faith, now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. What was the tutor? The law had become the tutor. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God, not through the law, not through keeping the Sabbath, not through keeping the feast days, not through circumcision, but you are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew. See, all distinctions have been broken down now because it's no longer about being physical Israel, right? Gentiles in that day, such as uh, they would have to in essence, become Jew or become Israelite through circumcision and allegiance to the law. No longer. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, how? By faith, then are you Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. I'll leave it at that. All right, Pastor Renice, do you have something? Because I saw you raise your hand. <laughs> Please don't mind my gestures. I'm about to say, listen, poker face, poker face. I don't have anything to add. My thing is, whenever you talk about the Sabbath and you talk about the law, it just it just boils down to we always take this one particular Sabbath, and we, for whatever reason, we we're, we make it harder than what it is because it's not hard, like. When we try to go back and forth, and I'm just, this is it. I'm not, you know, because everything has been said. But first of all, we have to be clear that when we have these discussions that, you know, it becomes debates or something in general when we're trying to come back with something to prove what's right or wrong when we will allow the spirit to give us clarity because that's how we edify one another. Basically, we all know in part, right? Everything is not going to be fulfilled until... The Messiah comes back. And the only point I'm going to say is that when we, that one scripture you use, Elder, um, when you said, but when faith came, but that's the whole key because the Messiah came. But just because he came doesn't erase who and what his purpose and mission was. We have to remember why he came. 
Matthew says he came to save his people. I came to save that which was lost. His purpose is saying, I absolutely know y'all can't keep the law. So what did the Messiah do? That's just like when it comes to the law. We have all these laws. But when I came, I had to study. You have categories of law. So really, what did the Messiah do? He fulfilled the sacrificial part of the law, period. That's, listen, and, I, and I'm not a scholar, y'all. I got some heavy hitters. I'm going to get my brother Divine Prospect back. Um, You might be my elder, like Pastor Kelly, my elder. I might be older. Don't come at me. Listen, <laughs> but let me say this to you. He just, why, why, why is that hard that he just fulfilled the blood sacrificial part of the law? Because them Levites, them priests, listen, they was offering up stinky sacrifice, blemish animal. They was keeping the fat stuff for them. They was being hoardish. Come on, that's what we do as a people right now. We wanted the best for ourselves. That's all. That's what this was about. Even if you take away that we as African Americans are not the people of the book. Let's go there, okay? I don't care that if you don't believe you're Israel, there is one faith, one way, one baptism and one doctrine, period. So we all are supposed to look, do what the word says, speak the same thing. There is no private interpretation. So we got to come away from pride, honestly, so we can edify and just keep talking about it little by little. Because if we don't understand that if we're saying the same thing, then why are we having the discussion? Because we're still living different. That's what this boils down to. Even though we're not in our own land, keeping the feast days, but guess what? We do it out of practice because when the Messiah comes, it's going to be perfected. But we do it so we can remember what we're trying to do. What? Please the Most High and honor the work of his son because he was the master strategist and I'm done because here I go. That's that path. That's that spirit coming in. I'm sorry. Listen, the bottom line is the most high already knew Adam was going to mess up. Listen, grace was, he kicked Adam out of the garden. That's grace. There was an oral command. Do not touch that tree. There was three trees in a garden. There was life. There was death. And there was the tree for food. Don't touch that. He knew that he was going to mess up. The Most High already, already knew what it was. His plan was that, listen, he's our redeemer and he wants us all to come and reign with him forever. That's the whole purpose of this life. How do I realize the purpose of my life is that he get the glory out of it and I was a light, a peculiar generation, a royal priesthood to be the light and the salt of the earth that this is what we do so all roads peel this way and I'm done. Don't don't ask me for nothing else. I ain't going to say nothing else. Bless y'all. One and done. One and done. Plate, man. Just give us this a collection plate, man. What's going on? <laughs> Can I say something really quickly before Pastor yes. Kelly? Just really, really quickly, because you know my brother got, you know, he breaks it down, you know. And so I'm just gonna say something really quick. When you look at John 17, chapter uh, John step chapter 17, verse six, it says, "I have revealed your name to the men whom you gave me." of the world they were yours and you gave them to me and they have guarded your word now they have come to know all that you gave to me is from you because the words which you gave to me i have given to them and they have received them and have truly known that i came forth from you and believe that you sent me i pray for them i do not pray for the world but for those whom you have given me for they are yours and i i'm making this point because we seem to think that Mashiach came for everybody in the world, but he said he didn't even pray for the word. And we have to understand what the world means. We're talking about a group of people. We're talking about the, like if you're talking about the music industry, that's the music world. If you're talking about the athletic industry, that's the athletic world. He said, I don't pray for the world. Now, when he's talking about world, he's talking about those that don't belong to him. He said clearly in the word, if we're going to go by the text, he said, I pray for those who belong, those who are yours. He said, I pray for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Who are yours? People say it doesn't. Man, she, she, you, you locked up. I was about to hit the <laughs> preacher chords. I was about yours to hit the that he's talking about. He's preacher talking about chords. the lost sheep of Israel, which are, <laughs> we are them. And, and I'm done. I'm done. Oh, I, I'm done. Um, I'm done. Um, doctor, you you were I'm breaking done. up. We couldn't hear it all. We but you was... It's getting hot in here. <laughs> oh. can, can, yes. I, I want to give clarity to what 
That's what he said. I want to get clarity to uh, what. Yeah, that, I mean, you, you, man, I was ready to hit the P preacher chords. Y'all going in up in here. What is it? E flat? Which, which one of you guys? E flat? Which one? <laughs> Can, can, can I say one thing, though? Uh, and I want to give clarity because um, uh, Elder mentioned Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. I mean, actually 17. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul. But when you, the key is understanding verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seeds were the promise made. He saith not to his uh, to seeds as many you know that's the key right there but when like i go back to that point the law of circumcision because the law of circumcision was given to abraham 430 years before the the the, the point that you're uh, making reference to they're dealing with the law of circumcision and what's interesting about the law of circumcision when you read the text when 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 the covenant was given to abraham right not just abraham and his blood descendants were circumcised it was all within the house that, that whether they was blood descendants or not so actually going back to paul's letter galatians he's dealing with the law of circumcision and oftentimes we take the law of circumcision and make it to all but let me give you let me give you a point here let me give you a point here right because if we go to Romans, let's see what apostle paul says because in in galatians he said we're not justified by faith right he, i mean um, by works right he said, we're not justified by works, but we do know that James gave a stern rebuke to that, right? About, uh, all right, let me go to James first and then I'll go to um, um, to Romans. Let me read what James said about um, responding to um, faith and works. Let's go to James real quick. Let me pull it up here and I'm going to read it. Chapter two. All right, let's see here. It says, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. It says this. All right. What do doeth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith, have faith and have not works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doeth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yeah, a man, I, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But it goes on to say, verse 20, but wilt thou, O vain man, the faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See us how faith wrought this wrought wrath with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. All right. So we see you got it. You can't just say you have faith and don't have works. You got to have both of those things. Right. But let me let me show you something here when we dealing with the law of circumcision, because that as divine prospect pointed out, as um, some of the others pointed out, Paul was what the, the he was the apostle to who? the uncircumcised. And that's one of the things that came up when you read Galatians chapter two, apostle Paul confirms that say the law of circumcision was given to Peter and he was the law of uncircumcision. I mean, not law, but the, um, the, um, ministry of, of going to the circumcision and vice versa and said that he was what given, uh, um, um, the letter and also handshake. They, they approved of him, but let me show you what Paul also says in Romans chapter, let's go to Romans real quick, chapter two, right? And that's why I say we, you know, when we're dealing with, we, we have to put it in this proper perspective because we're thinking that we just tossing everything out. But it says here, for the name of God is blasphemy. This is um, um Romans chapter two, verse twenty five. For the name of God is blasphemy, uh, blasphemy among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. It goes further. Therefore, if the circumcision 
um, the uncircumcision keep the righteous of the law? Shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter, the letter and circumcision doest transgress the law. All right. For he is not a Jew, which which is one outwardly, neither that circumcision, which is outward, outward in the flesh. But it goes on to say, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly and circumcised is that in the heart, or excuse me, the heart in, um, the, in the spirit and not the letter who prays not um um it, who prays is not of men but god but so we see here that we paul is still dealing with what the law of circumcision that's one of the things that he placed the point of emphasis on let me wrap this up real quick um going to chapter three still a continuation of this thought he said what advantage had the jew or what profit is there of circumcision we still we still dealing with what that law of circumcision Right. We could go further there. He says there. Let's go down to verse four. He says, God forbid, let God be true. But every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and might overcome when thou art judged. But if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say then? All right. You know, so you see here he's literally uh, uh, um, going further and giving proper clarity. But he's dealing with what the the. um. The law of circumcision. He's not, you know, he's not uh, um, tossing out all the law. We could go right through his letters and we'll constantly see him dealing with the law of circumcision. And so when you make reference to Galatians chapter three, verse 17, go to Genesis and you'll see that what the um, when the covenant was given to Abraham, how did they how did they seal that covenant by way of what circumcision? And so that's the key right there is that Paul is you know, going back to the prophecy Moses gave in um, uh, um, Deuteronomy 30, he placed a point of emphasis on circumcision of the heart, you know, and the, for, for the heart to be circumcised. And that's why Apostle Paul continuously brought that law up in his different letters. I can, go for it, can, I'll can, can I just ask him one quick question? And I'm not I'm going to take you. I'm not going to talk or, or even respond to the answer. But Pastor Richardson, would you say then, based on what you explained, that at least right because you made that what i read in galatians chapter three about circumcision so then you at least would say that circumcision is something that we no longer have to do then would you say is that what you're saying no i'm not what i'm saying is i'm not saying that that's something that we don't have to do because especially um but what paul is saying in the letter is if you if you don't have a change of heart and you you get circumcised what does it count if your, your heart is not changed, because remember, that's what the thing that they were pushing. They were like, um, what is that? Acts chapter 15. They were saying that, hey, people have uh, received Christ, the testimonies of Christ. But then others came behind Paul work, Paul and Barnabas and said, I mean, Barabbas saying, well, not Barnabas, um, Barabbas, but Barnabas saying, hey, that doesn't matter because you, you, you don't have a change of heart. So what I will say um, what I believe going off the scriptures, that circumcision is still important. But now what we see is Moses is what dealing with what he, he made a prophecy about the circumcision of the heart. So, again, when we see that with Abraham, circumcision was what part of the covenant that was handed down and everyone in this household got circumcised. So I'm, I'm going to say from from what I read of the scriptures and what it says on the law of circumcision, what Paul is saying, Paul is not saying that he just completely thrown out the law of circumcision, but he's saying is what is good is circumcision. If you don't what change the heart. That's what Paul is saying. If you, if you circumcise and your heart is not changed, then you just what undid your circumcision. That's what Pastor Paul said. So that's the point that, that that's the point that I want to echo is that guess what? If we don't have a change of heart, what does it matter? That's and that's exactly what Pastor Paul is saying. And I, I and I echo what he says. So one of the things I want to say is, you know, if we look at it, you know, the context of what Paul was saying about circumcision and non-circumcision, and then pretty much he was saying those who are of the law and who are not of the law, that you know, we can see that there's a different requirement because that original covenant was uh it, along with Abraham was confirmed with circumcising their sons. 
right? But we know that the true fulfillment of that ends up in the circumcision of the heart. That was the whole matter. Uh, the Bible talks about how the Old Testament was a shadow. And, you know, just to go back and, and, and I'm going to have to go after this. Uh, you know, when we were talking about the feast day, then, you know, we we're talking about the law. Right. And, and that's the distinction I'm trying to get here is that when you say you're keeping the law, I'm saying you're not. Because Deuteronomy 16, 16 says three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose at the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks and the festival of tabernacle. No one should appear before the Lord empty handed. So the place of his choosing what was the place of his choosing. The place of his choosing was the temple. It was in the land. It was Jerusalem. So, you know, we have to make sure that we understand that when we say or you all say you're keeping the law as it is written in the Old Testament. I don't see any of you all keeping it. OK, now, are you doing it in memorial? Oh, I'm cool with that. Yes. I mean, you know, and. You know, whether or not you want to celebrate the feast days, the holy, high holy days, all these things, you know, that's fine. It's not going to make you uh, pleasing to God. What's going to make you pleasing to God is faith in his son. And that's what the Bible talks about. Right. That's why the Bible says, why did the path that lead to destruction? Many that's on the straight and narrow the path that lead to eternal life. Few that be that find it. Why? Because Christ is the way to the father. That's the only way you're going to please him. The scripture says without faith. You can't please him. Faith in what? Faith in his son and what he has done for you. So thanks for having me on, Sister. I got to go. It's getting pretty late. Nice sharing with you all. Peace out. Now, now, before we close, I do have a question because I can't quite remember the scripture. When we talk about the commandments in Christ in Revelation, I think it's 14. I can't remember the verse, but it says the patience of the saints are the ones that keep the commandments and have faith in Jesus Christ. So we cannot ever take away from the fact of, yes, we have to have faith in Christ. But if you look at Revelation 14, it calls out both of them. But we have to have balance in both of them. This is always what I reference when I speak of God's commandments, that it calls those two things out, the patience of the saints. And those are the things that I, you know, that's how I look at it when I'm dealing with Christ, the faith of Christ, faith in Christ and his commandments. Revelation, what is it, 14? I can't remember off the top of my head. I can't hear you. I can't. You still can't. Unmute your phone. Oh, you also have Revelations chapter 12 when it says, uh, verse 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimonies of Jesus Christ. So you could keep the commandments and have what? The testimonies of Jesus Christ. And then Revelations 22, 14 and 15 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters. You get the gist of it. But what, we, what we want to be careful of is, is not making the error of equivocation. In other words, when you see the term commandments, you can't always equivocate that with Mosaic law. And that's the error of equivocation. In other words, you think that this word means the same thing in every context and every dispensation. That's wrong. Adam had commandments we don't have. Noah had commandments we don't have. None of us are building an ark in our backyard. So, so, so Abraham had commandments we don't have. We weren't called to leave our father's house and go to a land that he would show us. So their, their commandments commandments within every epoch of time. And so let's not equivocate the commandments of Christ. We all keep, but let's not make that necessarily. Now, if it is, let the text prove it, right? Because we don't see them in Revelation. It doesn't say keeping the Sabbath. It doesn't say, it doesn't say keeping the feast. So we want to be careful that we don't make the law, the era of equivocation by applying the same meaning every time you see a word in any context or in any time. That's the problem. Okay. Good. Quick question now. And let's make this clear. Who gave Moses the commandment? God did. So when we say God, when we talk about the manifestation of God, who is that? Who do you mean? Christ. Christ. Oh, Jesus Christ is God Christ. in flesh. So when he gave him those 10 commandments, we're going to stick just to the 10. That, those are the commandments of God that we're speaking of. When we say the Mosaic law, we have to be we have to ensure that we're not saying it as if Moses went to the side and just wrote some laws out. We got to realize that the very commandments that Moses held close to him, he got them from God. So when I totally up, agree. So when he says the commandments of God and faith in Jesus, are we speaking of the Ten Commandments that Moses gave? Can I ask you a question? God gave Moses. Did 
who gave Moses the Levitical laws to kill animals? But the thing is, we can't even equip. We can't was, was that God? Yes, that, that was God. But the, okay, so but so laws change. But, right? the law, but the thing is, she say this is good, this is sacrificial law. Christ is our sacrifice. He's our Passover. He's our yeah. Sabbath rest. He's all of that. <laughs> well, 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 Apostle Paul, even to your point, Elder, he said Christ is our what? Passover lamb. Let us honor the feast. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's a misunderstanding of the text. <laughs> there was a love feast. Contextually, there was a love feast that the church had instituted where they would come together. Remember the problem that there wasn't the Passover. Remember what Paul told them in first Corinthians where you're quoting. He said, you all are bringing food and some people don't have enough and you're not even sharing. And y'all have made the feast, the feast about about uh, about. Who has the most? You're clicking off with other people. That wasn't the feast that you're referring to, the Passover feast. No, not at all. No, that's where Paul went further. If you continue to read and says, let's do this. Right. And he 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 taught them the the not the Passover, but the communion to do in remembrance of the Lord's death. Again, we're not looking back at Egypt. We're looking forward to Christ. Now, now let me give clarity to that. Going to Christ. Right. When he de dealt with his disciples. Like when you understand the Pesach, right, you have um, and, it, and it, you could confirm this, too, um, even when you read Josephus and also when we get with um, uh, Exodus 12, mm -hmm. um, the Passover lamb. It was a lamb for um, one lamb for each household up to what? Uh, Twelve people. Right. And I so agree. when you understand that now, when the Hebrew Israelite Messiah is with his disciples honoring the Pesach, right, he is what? He said, when you do this, as you do this, do this in remembrance of who? Him. He said, as you, he's saying, not as you do the Eucharist, not as you do the Holy Communion. Amen. He said, as you honor what? The Pesach. That's what he's referring to it. Do he this in remembrance that. of who? He didn't well, break lamb. Right? He broke unleavened bread. So he didn't break lamb. One of, no, but what I'm saying is Christ, because it was 13 of them in that room, right? Mm -hmm. He became that what? That lamb for the house himself as well. So they didn't need a lamb anymore. Is that right? And, and, and that's what we are talking about. We, we agreed that he became what? He, he did away with the um the sacrifice because he became what? The Passover lamb. But let me let me get to the main point that I want to get to, because mm -hmm. what he's saying to his disciples, as you honor the Passover, right? Do this in remembrance of who? It doesn't say as you honor the Passover. No, but I'm saying, what are they doing? They're honoring the Pesach, right? The scripture no. says that the he, they're not honoring the Pesach in that scripture. Absolutely not. During that weekend, they, they are having Let's Passover read it. meal. It's, let's read it. it. If it let's says if, they, if it says they're having Passover, I'll repent and I'll convert to what you're saying. But it doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. <laughs> we could go to the history of the text and matter, we'll see that. Matter of fact, the they, they what, started what, doing this my, my point weekly. Is, what, when what they, Met and met house to house, breaking bread and fellowship and in prayers. And no, Acts chapter number two, what, this no, practice go, let, continued let not just on Passover once a year. Let me pull it up here. Sure. Hey, ladies, we're quiet right now, aren't we? Let's <laughs> <laughs> just get it. Amen. We're quiet. Come on, listen. You no, 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 I'm not. I have something to say. Oh, 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 Come on, listen. Oh wow. Go, go ahead, go ahead, Doctor Noel. I'll pull up the scripture real quick, but go ahead. Okay, so now we're talking, and because what the big mistake that we make is we don't research the etymology of a word. We take the word and we go with it, we run with that word, and we don't research the etymology of the word, but that's what I'm big about, the etymology of a word. And when you research in Revelation, I believe it's chapter 17, chapter 12 and 17, and you research the etymology of that word, commandments, the way that you said is in tole, which means when you research what that word means, when it was transliterated or translated, it means this. You ready? Mm -hmm. It means a precept relating to the lineage of a Mosaic precept concerning the priesthood ethnically, ethnic, ethnic, I can't even talk, I'm so excited. Ethnic, ethnic, help me y'all. Ethnically, ethnically, ethnically. ethnically. <laughs> <laughs> ethnically used of the commandments and the Mosaic laws of the Jewish tradition. What, what do you I read looked it up. I looked it up where? 
I read right, 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 what's the, that cite word the because you're looking at an English word. But see, when cite we study the, the word of Yah, we need to break it down. Yes, it's a scripture, but remember, the scriptures were not originally written in English. Absolutely, that's why I know Greek and, and, and study Hebrew. Hebrew as well. And and neither of those so are the Hebrew definition I, of that can word. Can I talk rather because I listened to you a long time? Please just let me finish my thought. Uh, okay? Yes, ma'am. I don't mean uh, cut when you, you look it up. That's what that that word means. See, because I'm not going to speak on something unless I researched it and I have mm -hmm. the backing that tells me this is what that word means in that language. It was translated into English, and that's why we need to go past what we're reading in the English when we get stuck on these words because some of the words that they use in the English don't mean what it what they originally said. We have a different type of dialect, a different type of language. And so we have to research these things so we can properly understand what is being said so that when we disperse it, we can disperse it with the knowledge of what we are actually talking about, not what we think that it said. And I'm not, I'm not throwing stones at anyone. I'm just saying that one thing that I was taught coming up in the ministry, because I come from an old apostolic background, an apostolic background, and I'm Hebrew now. I was taught to research. I was taught to find out where, who they were talking to, why they were saying it, where they were at, what was the customs of the land that pertained to what was being said in the word. And so we have to be very careful that when we research and people say, I don't need to know what the Hebrew means. I don't need to know what a word means in, in Greek. I don't need to know what a word means in Aramaic. Yes, you do. Because guess what? It wasn't written in English. We learned this language when they bought us here. We didn't, we didn't, our people didn't always speak this language. So when they transliterate or translate, just like when you say Yahusha or Yeshua or Yeshua or Yesh, uh, Yah, Yahusha, it doesn't mean Jesus. It doesn't mean Iosos. Those are two different words. That's a transliteration because there is no word that can compare to Yahshua or Yahweh. So they had to take the thing closest to it and implement it into the word of God. And before then, Jesus wasn't even in the Bible. It was Iosos. But you understand what I'm saying? We have to research these things so that when we bring this knowledge to the table, we don't have to argue the fact. We just need to speak the fact. There's no... Uh, there's no argument or anything like that. I don't get upset when people don't agree with what I'm saying. I don't get upset when Amen. people come with a different concept. Because you know what, Dom? There's some stuff in there that I learned from you tonight. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I don't, you know, we don't have to, um, how can I say it? We don't have to be offended or take offense because somebody is coming with a different school of thought. And then our, our whole tone begins to change. And instead of discussing now where it's, it's like you're challenging me and I got to challenge you back. No, we just talking here and that's all I'm doing. So I'm not talking for someone to come back with, girl, what are you talking about? I'm telling you what I know to be true and that we need to study the etymology of a word so that we can clearly understand and, and speak and release the people what is being said it takes it's more than just reading the word and just praying for a revelation you read the word you pray for a re revelation but you research what you're reading also i mean people sometimes people say and they get the revelation but what spirit are you listening to the spirit of air or the spirit of truth because in the word what i understand about the spirit of truth the spirit of truth will lead you into all truth not just partial truth and like you said it's progressive this going walking in truth is progressive when i first came in i didn't understand a lot of stuff so i was quiet and i sat back i studied i researched and i learned but it is progressive and we are progressively learning none of us have it all we're learning from each other we're bouncing off of each other none of us have it all but what we can do is sit down to the table and discuss what we have and leave from the table hopefully gaining knowledge from one another and not just saying that's not what it says but going and researching ourselves after what was released to us, researching ourselves to make sure that we didn't miss something. Now, I'm not saying that what you're saying, you don't have no truth in all what you're saying. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. We can learn from one another if we stop trying to prove our point and just speak the truth that we have and we speak what we know to be true and not be trying to force it on somebody. So that's all I really had to say. And I hope I didn't offend anybody with that. But no, I thank the most high for tonight because I was blessed tonight. I really enjoyed everything, everything tonight. I really enjoyed, I blessed the most high. And listen, I want to say something to Divine Prospect. I might be younger than him too. So he better watch yourself. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but Come on. If I could just, um, that word uh, uh, entole in Greek is entole. It, it, it's not 
the, the definition, and I don't know if uh, Sister E will share the screen, but I am seeking to share it. But it's an ordering authorization of a specific action. It's a mandate or order, ordinance. It's a command. Um, so uh, I, I'm not trying to refute what you're saying there's as such. To, well, hold on, there's hold on. I, in, the same there's, book, in the same place. There are several of them. Right. There's several of them and I've got them up on the screen now. I'm None of them. them, I'm either, but, them. But, but, but all right. But I would. That's why I asked if you could cite the source. I wasn't trying to be argumentative with your dear sister. So I, I want to make sure uh, if I came off like that, I apologize. Right. But but here it is. Right. Here, here's the definition. And I'll scroll. It's, it's in a order of authorizing a specific action, a warrant. A ma here's the second definition, a mandate, an ordinance, a command of commands in high position, right? It, it starts to give examples. I won't get off into it. Here's the word here, entole in Greek, anthropon. So in other words, this is the command given to man. So this anthropon is also man, right? So the command given to man. So so there's nothing in here, right? Uh, now it gets off into of the commandments of OT law when it's talking about when it's mentioned, the same word is mentioned in the Old Testament. But there's nothing in Entole that brings out what 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 you indicated. There's there's nothing okay, in there. I just so that's why I asked that you would uh, cite the source. I did. Please. I sent it okay, to. I appreciate e. it. Thank it's you. It's a strong light exhausted concordance. I sent it to E. Okay, I'm okay. gonna I'm gonna pull it up now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We didn't broke down into sharing screens now. Hold on. Right. <laughs> right. We got real up in here. <laughs> hold on. Uh, I screenshot right. it and sent it to right. her. So, so, and I want to, and I'm looking at it as she pulls it up. But now, remember, you you can't pull the second. The, that is the definition as given in the old covenant, right? But the initial word as used, no, the no, primary definition, it, you can't apply every aspect of the definition. Context matters, right? And so. The Brother. precept relating to the lineage of the Mosaic precept concerning the priesthood. Now, you and I would agree that the priesthood is ended. So you can't use that definition in Revelation when the Levitical priesthood ended with the death of Christ. Let me. OK. OK. I, let me say this. All right. If it was a different word, we know that there are different words that the Greek used when they interpret things. So if it was a different word, they would have put it into a different word. They would not be the same definition for the same it would not be the same word for all of the definitions so what i'm saying to you my dear beloved brother is this that when we talk about the when he talk about the commandment in the book of revelation we understand that when this when the book of revelation is being spoke it's a prophetic book so we're not just talking about uh the death of christ we're talking about inclusive of mankind it's talking about all of this in the book of revelation you're taking it as if it's just they're, they're just talking about the commandment that came after the death of Christ, which would be the renewed or the new commandment, which is the old commandment that was refreshed and restored. There's, I can't be taken off of that knowledge of that because I researched it and that's what it was. He didn't come with something new or brand new. He came with the same commandment. This is in here. If it was a different word, they would have gave you a different word for that definition. All of this is inclusive. So you can look at this and when you talk about the Mosaic commandment, yes, we know that the Levitical priesthood is no more and we're under the priesthood of Melchizedek. Exactly. We understand that. But we understand the Levitical priesthood is talking about when they were doing all the sacrifices. And we go back to this again, that Mashiach was the, the final, not the not the eternal sacrifice. He was the final sacrificial lamb. That means he's not being sacrificed each and every day, every time we sin. And I want to make this point as, as well. And I can't see if you put your finger up, uh, uh, Sister E. I want to make this point as well. What the, the difference between Breaking the law then and breaking the law now is breaking the law then. When you broke one law, you broke them all and you were worthy of death. Breaking the law now, you broke only that law. And because of the grace of Mashiach through his death, burial, and resurrection, you have grace and mercy through that. So now you're not being condemned to death because he took the stone for us. You're not being condemned to death, but you're being held accountable for that. You're being, you're, you're, it's recognized not that you broke all of the law at this point. You only broke one law. So you're not, you're not being convicted of breaking all of the law. That's the difference between the law back then and the law now. Back then, if you broke one law, you were guilty of them all. Now, if you break one law, you're guilty of that law that you broke. And, but we have grace and mercy through Mashiach, and, and they're not 
you're not being stoned to death because once again, he's the sacrificial lamb. This is the concept. This is the precept. This is what I understand about this. If I'm wrong, if someone comes with something that will show me in the word that I'm wrong, then I will willfully receive it. And the whole mindset about this, it will change. But the law still exists. But we're not talking about the law. We're talking about the Shabbat. But the law still exists. But there's the difference between it is we're not being stoned for the law because of the Mashiach. Now, if I'm wrong, tell me. But I got your word. I ran it on the screen. Can, um, can I just um, share the scripture real quick? I'll just I'll just say it to him and we could um, continue the discussion at another time, um, Sissy, because I know it's getting late. But um, to, to Elder uh, Matthews 26, right, starting at verse um, 17, we see that uh, it says now the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread and the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare uh, for thee to eat? Um, to eat um, the Passover. And so even in this text right here, what are they doing? They're preparing for what? The Passover. The Lord's Supper or the, uh, is connected to what? The Passover. This is the, the, and, and what Christ is saying, while they're celebrating the Passover, do this in remembrance of who? Him. Let me just read it. I don't want to just recite. I'll just read it to you. It says here, and he said, go into the city. Well, we, we get to just to that, but verse, um, yeah, I'll just read it. Go, uh, and he said, Going into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at the house with my disciples and the and the disciples did as Jesus had appointed, um, pointed them and they made ready the Passover. Now, when the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve and as they did eat, he said, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. This is all what? Um, 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 and, um, during the Passover, right? And it goes on to say, he says, he goes on to say this. He says, um, and they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say to him, Lord, is it I? And he answered, uh, well, I'm gonna go a little further than I don't wanna read all of that, take up a lot of time. But going out of verse 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take it, take, eat. This is my body. And he uh, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new cover. I mean, the New Testament, which is shared for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink it. You know, we, we see the whole thing right here. Right here, and I could get up, get the other scriptures of the disciples pointing out, but we see this is occurring what at Passover when they're when they're honoring the Passover, just like this is where you get the Eucharist from. The Eucharist is based off of the Passover, the pat the meal that the Hebrew Israelite Messiah is having with his disciples. The communion, this is all based off of what? The Pasach. So what he's saying is, you know, like going back to your point and, and some of the points that many has made, you know. When we're dealing with the feast days, right, you know, he's he's showing his disciples when they honor the, the feast days based off the testimonies that they have what um, developed by what walking with them, sitting, sitting with them, being taught directly by him. That what when they honor the Passover and Paul confirms it, he said, guess what? Christ is what our Passover lamb. Right. So as they're honoring the Passover, now they're not honoring. They're not basing it upon what the, 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 the lamb that was physically killed. But now is what being based on Christ whenever they come together to do what? Honor the Passover. That's what they're on. They, they're doing it to, in remembrance of what the Hebrews are like Messiah. And if I could just respond real quickly in first Corinthians, where Paul is teaching this to the Corinthian church made up of mostly Gentiles. He doesn't say uh, Passover. I would agree with you, Pastor Kelly. I think you made a good point. And so I appreciate that. Uh, it was established where Christ established the communion. It was during the time of Passover. You're absolutely correct. However, within the Passover, he establishes the Lord's, what we would call the Lord's Supper or communion. Right. And notice what he says. And I'll just read this one verse uh, or two verses here in 1 Corinthians 11, 25. He says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper so now we're see the passover was the supper but here's something that happened after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do 
as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. After the supper, this do in remember, not the supper, but this do. And then he says in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And not as often as you keep Passover. And, and he doesn't say the, annually when you keep Passover, because again, going right into Acts, this became customary, a custom uh, Mary practice that the apostles continue, not just annually during Passover, but daily oftentimes and weekly, they continue this practice. So this is not centered on Passover. This was something established, you're correct, at Passover after the supper, but continue into the New Testament church as something to be done on a regular basis. And just real quick, and as we get ready to wrap up, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, right? Verse 7 starts off by saying, um, purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us therefore let us keep the feast not of the old leaven uh, not with old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and heart so right there he says dealing with this right here purge mm -hmm. out Right. Uh, matter of fact, um, um, let me go to verse eight, rather. Therefore, let us keep the feast. <laughs> right. So uh, he's telling them how to keep the feast, you know. But but anyway, we'll deal with that another time um, for the sake of time. And um, again, this, this is not we, we're not up here trying to beat each other, beat each other. We we here, you know, building off of each other. And, and I want to make it clear that it's this. I hope no one takes it from a perspective that me and elder going back and forth or anything like that because truth be told if you know the scriptures this is what they did you know what i mean they discussed the text so i just wanted to give clarity to that i just wanted to read that one scripture to give clarity that paul is saying let us honor the feast right let us honor the feast all right i'll stop right there so, all right oh oh come on ron come on ron you've been gone no, no, I, 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 I've I, been multitasking while they were talking. So I, I didn't, I got some stuff. I didn't get everything. Um, I, I just, I didn't know if you had any more time to see, because I knew earlier, like 30 minutes ago, you was like, <laughs> you about to close down. <laughs> <laughs> no, we done got here. We started over again. This is you what to put on a baseball is. cap. Look, look, this thing is giving us grace. So we got to thank the sister for grace, because we talked on oh, right. <laughs> 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 yeah, I can do it too. I told my folks, I said, look, y'all have fun, but we good. I yeah. am this i am so grateful that everyone did this and i want to do this again uh because everybody enjoyed it and i think this is edifying we have to be able to come to the table and talk regardless of the fact that we don't agree on something this is the point of this so ron i know you got something you need to say go on my brother um no i'm i'm, I'm just gonna say much i'm just gonna um just end off because i want to be respectful of the time um and what i simply want to do is i just want to encourage christians to read the Tanakh without the New Testament in mind, right? Um, and I'm not saying that we don't need the New Testament. Obviously, you know, we wouldn't be here talking about this if the New Testament didn't have relevance. But what I'm saying is just read the Tanakh without the New Testament and just see what conclusions you come to before you get to the New Testament, because that will be your basis to interpreting what is being said in the New Testament. If you don't have a foundation in the Tanakh, and when you say things like, well, every time you break a law, you got to give a sacrifice. Where's that in the Tanakh? The Tanakh doesn't say that. There's so many things that people do and there's allowances for things. For example, you know, if, if a man or woman are married, they lay down and whatever happens, happens. They're unclean until the evening and they're permitted to go and wash themselves. Right. Well, what's the sacrifice for that? Is there a sacrifice for that? So if I so if if people do that today and say, oh man, you know what? I, we forgot to wash immediately. You know what I'm saying? So we're gonna be clean an extra day. Are you saying that the most high is gonna come and judge you and say you're gonna go straight to hell because of that? No. So what I'm saying is when you read it, you see that the most high is shown his grace and his mercy in the Tanakh. It's all throughout the Tanakh. The grace and the mercy is there. You'll see that the customs that's being practiced. And better sheet can be answered by understanding the Mosaic law, what we call the Mosaic law, because you got to understand nobody was writing those things contemporarily in the book of Genesis. Right. 
Moses wasn't there when Adam was there. Moses wasn't there when Jacob was there, right? So they're writing these things posthumously after these characters had already passed, and they're writing it through the lens of their culture, which you see in the theocratic law. So what I'm saying is if we dismiss that and say, well, you know what? This is the Mosaic law. You have to look at the context in which it's applied. And I still, to this day, have not gotten an answer from any Christians for Genesis chapter 26, verse 5. What are these statutes, these laws, these commandments, and in the Hebrew, the Torah, what are these things that Abraham was keeping where he encouraged Isaac to do the same? What is that doing there? It's because, again, when you understand who is writing this element, if we attribute Moses, again, he still wrote it after these individuals died. If you were giving it to the priests or priestly scribes, they're writing it after these characters died, but they're doing it through the lens of their culture because they understand the things that they were doing were things that our ancestors were already doing. But when we got into Egypt, we were there for so long that we lost a lot of our indigenous culture. So the theocratic laws was there to reestablish these things when we got into the land and some of these things were perpetual. So you, you cannot remove things that are perpetual and, and then you put, okay, I'm gonna put stipulation on this. I'm gonna put a stipulation on that. Most I no, 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 this is perpetual. When I ask people today who are Christians, and again, I love my, my Christian brothers and sisters. I'm just saying it within context. And I said, well, who are the real Jews today? Well, you know, it's the Jews that's there in the land. I said, what about the Ashkenazim that are there in Germany that are keeping the law? Are they considered Jews? They were like, yeah. I'm like, well, are they keeping the law? Well, yeah, they're keeping the law. I'm like, well, how can they keep the law? They're outside the land too. They don't understand things such as halakha. They don't understand what that is. You ask them, well, what is halakha? And when you ask them things such as being dispersed, when the Israelites will wake up, Mosai said his people is going to wake up when they're in these foreign lands. They're going to wake up to their identity. And what's going to happen is they're going to be keeping the things of their culture because that's what makes you Kodesh or set apart. So when Yeshua came, he came to reinforce that which was lost. When he first came, the first thing he said in the book of Mark chapter one was repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven. Why is he telling them to repent? The kingdom is at hand. Well, guess what? He's only reiterating the things that Nebaim was saying before he got on the scene. They were telling Israel to repent. They were telling Israel about the kingdom that was coming. This is not no new gospel that was coming on the scene. But when you have all these years and Persian Greco and Roman captivity, you begin to lose these things. When you have a situation where the Maccabean revolt had to occur because of desecration of the temple with the sacrifice of ping on the altar, now you have people fighting, establishing the Hasmonean dynasty and that being undermined by infiltrates that was working with people that was co-signing them within the Hasmonean dynasty, brought that down. And now you have people who are trying to live day to day. And in order for them to live in the system, they had to compromise. In order for me to do business, I had to accept certain things in order for me to catch my fish and sell them. In order for me to a publican, there's certain things I have to agree. What Yeshua came to do is came to reestablish that which the Father had already given. And because these things were lost to the people because they were laid in down, but all of the oral law stipulations from the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin Council, and all of the Hellenism that was still going on. Matter of fact, the reason why the, the, the Greeks were listening to Paul because they said, hey, he got a new doctrine. Like, when it comes to their philosophical thing, they were always looking for something new. So Paul had to appeal to them. Never once did Paul say the law was done away with in a sense where he stopped keeping it. Paul showed in Acts chapter 21, he was still willing to keep the law. We talked about circumcision earlier. Paul still went after Acts 15 and Acts 16 and got somebody circumcised. Why is he doing that? Why is Paul circumcising somebody in Acts chapter 16 if the law of circumcision was already done? And we got to remember the earliest epistles of Paul is Colossians and Galatians. Those are the earliest according to academia. And then we go on to other scriptures like Corinthians and so forth. So when they're looking to see the ideology of Paul or Pauline Christology, which you can read from a book called Gordon G. D. Fee, it's called Pauline Christology, where he lays out and categorically lays out the entire theology of Paul through his Christology all the way from Galatians, all the way to Romans and everything in between, the thing that you have to understand is these presuppositions that Paul was applying to a Gentile church that had some Israelites in it. And when you understand the audience and what she's talking to, the first laws of hermeneutics is to identify the speaker in the audience within its immediate context, which is historical, which is textual or contextual, not the pretext, not the subtext, but the contextual nature of the text is being written against what background, what political stresses, social stresses, economic stresses, spiritual stresses that the people had, were they being persecuted in this reason when he was writing to them, did they have access to Torah in this area when he was writing to them? If you do not study and understand the backdrop, 
You can't just drop your theology, just open up the text without understanding the backdrop. That's not good hermeneutics. So what we're simply saying is all the things that were being re-emphasized by Yeshua, that was being re-emphasized by the apostles and Paul, were things that were already encased in the law. The problem was what Yeshua said to the Pharisees, you over here giving tithes of mint and coming, but you've missed the weightier matters of what? Of the law. Wait, 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 hold on. Let me bring this up since people think that I'm bugging out because he obviously appealed to the law, speaking to the Pharisees and said, these weightier matters, y'all not put it on even scales and balances, which the most High says is an abomination if you have uneven scales and balances. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. all your legalism is up here, but these spiritual things that deal with the concrete nature that works in harmony with this, y'all unbalanced. Let me bring up scripture up and I'm gonna end off with that. And I'm about to hit the preacher chorus. Go ahead, you're preaching, Ryan, you're preaching. I'm hitting the <laughs> yeah. preacher chorus. And, 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 and then he tells the people, he says, the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes sit in the seat of Moses. All that they tell you to do. Wait, some, wait, part. All that they tell you to do. What did he say? He said, do it, but don't do as they do, which is hypocrisy. Because they'll tell you to do this. He says, do it, but they themselves behind closed doors, they're not doing it. This is why in, in the later chapters of Matthew, he was giving them all of these uh, reprimanding when he was telling them, you know, woe unto the Pharisees, woe unto the Pharisees, because he was trying to make a point. It was the fact that they were clouding the pureness of the law, that David says that if you do not keep the law, then most I will not even hear your prayer. I ask Christians all the time, has that been annulled? Has that been done away with? Do we do we have to just say, okay, you know what? Yeshua was here. Let's Let's, let's, let's mark that off the text. Are we becoming Marcion now? Where we're cutting out the whole Old Testament or selecting things that we're saying, okay, you know what? Get that out of here. Get that out of here. Get that out of here. Get, are, are we becoming Marcion now? We None of us are Marcionites here. So we have to deal with the text by first understanding the Tanakh within its own context, historically, linguistically, contextually. And then once we have a framework to build with, then when Yeshua says that, lo, I come in the volume of the book. We said, oh, yeah, we know what that means, right? We're not saying every incident has to do with Jesus. Like Christians have even told me that. Like, I'm like, everything in this in the Old Testament is about Jesus. So when you see a situation when Onan is doing what he's doing and spilling the seed, that has to do with Jesus, they'll come out with a sermon. Yeah, you know what? Let me show you how that has to do with Jesus. This is like, what? And then it, then it blurs the line between what is literal and what is figurative. When we see in the book of Zechariah, it says that the Feast of Sukkot will be reinitiated. And then all the Gentiles are going to come and keep it. All the nations, why are they keeping that? When we see in the book of Isaiah where it says that the Levites and the priests are going to be restored, well, well, why is it saying that? When you get to the book of Micah where it says the law is going to go forth from Zion in the end times, well, why is it saying, why is all these things saying that if the law is no longer valid? Is Yah going back on his word? Did he change his mind with that? He said, the book of Numbers says that God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. So if that is the context and his character, then when we get to the New Testament, why are we acting like there's some new deity on the scene? As if the father hasn't already been here orchestrating, pulling the strings and doing what he's been doing. And I and I say that's what we fall short. So I just want to read this one last scripture. And I, all, I always say this. I tell my brothers and sisters, listen, the New Testament is valuable. We get our soteriological position from there, but it is not the foundation the foundation is what preceded it because without the Tanakh, Yeshua will be here in vain. Without the Tanakh, his coming would be in vain. Without the disobedience of Israel that we learned from, Paul said, whatsoever things were written aforetime, written by learning so that we do education and comfort in the scriptures might have hope. Wait a second. So I got to read this and understand it so I can look forward to the hope. Well, if you're not examining that particularly, using it to undermine a lot of the erroneous thinking that we have because we're looking at it theologically from the New Testament and using that lens to cast land on the Old Testament instead of looking at the foundation of the Old Testament and use it to springboard the New Testament so that it can rebound back to the Old Testament. Well, our entire methodological approach to it has been so confined to an orthodoxy that does not want to appreciate the cultural mandates of the Tanakh. And all we want to do is bring it forth. So let me read this, this last scripture, and I'm out of here. I think I, I said uh, too much, uh, but I'm going to say this, and I'm out of here, right? Let me bring it up. Scripture that I'm looking for is Matthew. Put it up in my uh, – do we have screen share on here? I don't know if you have screen share. Yeah, we got screen share. Uh, so Matthew 23, 23, just so that everybody can follow me, I'll go ahead and click on the screen share real quick, and then I'm done. 
All right, here it is. Did you hit the screen? Yep. So okay. here he says it very clear. Now, again, whenever Yeshua is speaking, we have to look at the audience. In this case, in Matthew 23, he's giving these woes to who? To the Pharisees, right? Who he then tells the people, they sit in the seat of Moses. Everything that they tell you to do, do it. Gentiles there, when he was saying this? Do we have to consider that? That there was possibly Gentiles that was there where he's saying everything that they say to do, do it? That's a good question we need to ask, right? When Okay. And when he was on the Sermon of the Mount, when he was right next to the Valley of Hinnom, where you have the Gehenna, you know, with this perpetual burning of the refuge of the city, when he's speaking about it's better for you to have one eye, right, and go into everlasting life than have two eyes and then burn in everlasting hell. And Gehenna's there and the fires are raging and people are seeing that saying, wow, that's, that's incredible. He was very visual when he was saying things. He was very descriptive when he was saying things. And he said to disciples, these things are for you to know. But I speak it to them in parables. They don't know, but to you, I speak plainly. Why? Because those who have an ear to hear understand that his essence didn't just start in the New Testament. His essence was all throughout the Old Testament. And if we don't fully understand that, then what, what are we really reading in the New Testament? A new religion? Are we, are we disconnecting the most high who is eternal, who's omniscient, omnipresent from all his characteristics he's doing from the Old Testament to say, you know what? Wait, let's put that on hold now and let's go ahead and just tackle this New Testament and that's it. We, we can't approach it like that, right? And the scripture is very clear. I'll, I'll grab the, um, the ESV. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill in coming and have neglected the weightier matters of, of grace. No, no, no. The weightier matters of faith. Oh, wait a second. Wait, the weightier matters of the law, which is what? Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Watch this. Those you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Why would he say something like this? And, and, and die and have his disciples say something opposite of that. Why would he say something like this? What I'm saying is that right there would be a big issue. And then we'd have to say that Yeshua, he's not really doing what he's supposed to do. Why is he not doing what he's supposed to do if he's supposed to come here and say we are to believe his word because what he speaks is not his words, it's the word of the Father. But then we're going to say, well, after he died, all that changed. Then that means everything he said when he was alive was null and void. He says here, then Jesus said to the crowds and, and to his disciples, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but do not the works they do for they preach, but do not practice. That was the issue. The issue was there were too many hypocrites that were claiming to be teachers of the law, but they would never do the things that were the weightier matters, which goes to show that the law itself cannot save you. Don't say the law is going to save you. If that was the case, then those Israelites that were legalists in the wilderness through Moshe, they would have made it to the promised land. They didn't make it through the promised land. Moses says, circumcise the foreskin of your heart, you stiff neck and stubborn people. That right there was a spiritual thing. Circumcise the foreskin of your heart. You're going to keep those matters of the law and not neglect the weightier matters because those weightier matters are the characteristics and attributes of the patron deity that gave them the law in the first place. That's all I got to say. Yes. Well well, that's good. Come on, um, Micah. Hey, well, I got time. Well, I want to. I, I want to say this: that uh, from the biblical Christian perspective, we're no, we're not antinomian, and the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who walk after the Spirit. That's not in dispute here. What we're disputing are the practices or training wheels, if you were will, that were given to them within their nation. So a Christian isn't murdering and lying and cheating and fornicating and committing adultery and lusting and coveting. Christian isn't doing those things. Not a biblical Christian. He isn't. He, he's practicing the scriptures and, and the law certainly identified what sin was. The problem is there were practices given that were specific. And, and so I'm not going to take all day because we'll we'll be another three hours. But my point is that I don't disagree with everything that was stated. Right. Nobody is getting rid of the Old Testament. You, That's impossible. Christ is written from Genesis through Revelation. That that, that would be dumb. 
for a Christian to say that we don't need the Old Testament anymore, you, you're not really a biblical Christian <laughs> because those things are written for our learning and admonition. Yes, the scribes and Pharisees, uh, they, they left out the weightier matters of the law. Judgment was in the law. Mercy and faith, were, they were all a part of the law. But there were other things instituted with the law to help them to learn how to keep those uh, laws that God commanded. And so what we're discussing now isn't the inward acts of righteousness, but the outward displays that would distinguish Israel from the other nations like circumcision, like wearing fringes, like, like wearing a beard and don't cut it and, and all of this other stuff. Those things are what we're discussing tonight. So I just wanted to make clear that the biblical Christian is a, is a Christ commandment keeper. And so when Pastor Kelly reads the verse in First Corinthians and says uh, circumcision doesn't matter, right? Nor uncircumcision matters, but the keeping of the laws of God, I say, amen. We keep the laws of God. Which laws? The righteousness of the law. Not the fringes as such. I don't need a reminder because the law is written in my heart. I don't need a reminder on a certain day to worship because I'm worshiping him every day. I don't need to eat lamb because I'm, I'm because I'm because he's my Passover lamb. And so we're, we're, we're dis the discreet disagreement isn't about whether or not we keep the commands, right? It isn't. What it's about are the training wheels that were built around the law that Paul called the schoolmaster that we're no longer under. We are saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves. And But that faith produces good works. That's why there's no conflict between James and Paul. When James says, have you uh, faith and have not works? No, a Christian without works isn't a Christian. But what works? Let's not make those works wearing fringes. Let's not make those works a legalized day of worship. Let's not make those works whether or not you cut lamb on a certain day of the year. No, those things were the schoolmaster. Those works are righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those works are listed in Galatians chapter number five. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, and faith. We don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. There are 17 of them Paul lists there in Galatians 5. Talk about a adulteries, fornications, idolatries, and such like. Because if you're led by the spirit, there is no law. Why? Because we're governed by the spirit and the righteous character found in the law is fulfilled in the New Testament believer. We keep the law, right? But we keep the law of Christ. Don't think law means 613 mosaic laws. That's where we disagree. Can I say one quick one, just one statement, one sentence? I promise this. I see why y'all did this all the time. This becomes addicting. Wait, I got one more. Listen. <laughs> but what you're saying is, two, one thing I want to say is, it boils down to obedience and relationship. Like everything we're talking about, it's about what do I do to be obedient? But then Paul said, I would not know what sin was except but for the law. Amen. So you can't erase the fact that there is no law. Amen. Like, I hear, Elder, you said some real good because what I hear you say after all time, this is why this is like, y'all, this is the bomb conversation. So if you're agreeing with us saying that the law is pertinent, yeah, we do keep the law, but there is absolutely no way you can take the fact away of just the foundation that Paul is solidified everywhere in the Barit Hadashah. It is confirming what has been established. So if you take away, take renew out, take new, take all of those buzzwords out of the way. Don't let's not talk about what's new. Now let's talk foundation because Christ said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except but by me. Amen. If he is the example. I must be obedient to the very word of the Most High. I'm going to say in your language, to the very word of the Most High God to follow who the word came and lived. He came and lived and dwelt among us. So if he was a keeper of what his father spoke, because that's who he was, then why can't we just do what he did and follow his example, period? You know what I'm saying? Like, Because that's not what he said do. 
See, Christ was born under the law. He fulfilled it on our behalf because mankind broke the law. So, yes, Christ was born under the dispensation of the law. Right. But what did he teach? What did the disciples teach? If you but, can show me any disciple telling people to keep the Sabbath, I, I will show I'm me. Tell you. So that's yeah. easy. But that's easy. Look, I'm All an right. amateur at this. This is fun. I'm an I, amateur. Listen, I'll repent absolutely right here. Absolutely. If the they Messiah gotta say it, chose, <laughs> if the Messiah chose the 12, the 12 he chose were his disciples who were continuous learners who yes. he taught how to share the gospel after he left. Amen. So therefore they repeated that which was taught to them so they, that, that he was their absolute example. So you still can't separate the fact what that verse? the Messiah was not a contradiction to what his father said. He mm -hmm. always gave credence back to the father. I and my father is one. Listen, don't give me praise. Listen, recognize what my father said. He's the establisher. Listen, don't put me over who I'm just throwing this out there just to say that we can't, how do we, and we'll stay here all night because this is just where the fork in the road is. How were we able to take away something that's so simple that identifies Everything about our human existence. The law identifies where we are weak. It identifies and put a name on what's Amen. wrong. It Amen. identifies that we cannot live this life without Christ. Amen. But don't we think when you say law. Without Christ, if we can't live the law without Christ, then that means we have to look at him and do what he did. Because watch this. The Bible says greater works than these will you do. But you got to do what I did and live how I live because well, honestly, we don't have to sin. Now, come on, let's talk about that. And I'm about to be done because see, well, he you, say they have no we don't have to sin. You know why? Because we have the power and the authority to say no. How? Because when we look at the Torah and it says, do not covet, and it says, do not steal, and it says, love your neighbor, and it says, do not bear false witness, and it says, shun the very appearance of evil. Mm -hmm. That give, that's Amen. giving us power. Amen. I'm I would sorry, say I'm done. Real quick. I promise. I'm sorry. I, I just want to say something real quick, um, and, I and I'm going to have to. I don't apologize, Sister uh, Pastor Anita. No, that's oh. right. you preaching. <laughs> Keep it going. Don't apologize. Nobody apologizing yes, up in yes, here. Yes, yes. Right. I just want to say this because, <laughs> you know, when we start, we have to like um, 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 Brother Ron, um, Divine Prospect, rather, pointed out Elder. I'm calling him Elder because he is Elder. You know what I mean? Um, what he pointed out um, is we see that the Hebrew genocide is the volume of the book, right? And we agree to that, right? From the beginning to the end, the volume of the book. Even though he gave some key points saying that, you know, and I agree with him, Christ, you, you cannot get Christ out of uh, Judah with Te uh, Tem Tamar. You can't, you know, you can't get it. You can't get that out of that. But what I will share is this, because this is where the danger that we're getting into is saying that there's a law for Yah's people. But then there's another law for those that are not Yah's people. You know, hmm. we're we're teaching that there's a separate that there's two different uh, 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 approaches. I mean, hey, y'all, y'all, y'all fulfill it this way. Y'all fulfill it over here. But I just want to say this about the Sabbath. This is what um, Isaiah 56 uh, verse six. Said. I mean, I'm starting at um, actually verse two. It says, blessed is the man that doeth this and is and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth what the Sabbath from what polluting it and keep it his hand from doing any evil but it goes on to say neither let the son of the stranger have that have joined himself to yahweh speaking saying the lord hath utterly separated me from his people neither let the eunuch say behold i'm a dry tree but it goes on to say this for thus saith the lord of the eunuchs that keep my sabbath and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than the sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that they shall not be cut off. But it goes further here. It doesn't stop there. It says, and also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to 
the Lord Yahweh to serve him and to, uh, and to love the name of Yahweh, the Lord, to be his servant. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and take hold of my covenant. But this is the kicker. Even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer that burnt offerings, their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar for my house shall be called and house of prayer for all people. Right. So we see that that's not a separation between Yah's on um, the blood descendants of Israel and those that are what choosing sons of the strangers that want to have a relationship with Yah. We see that consistency when we look at, uh, as I pointed out with Abraham and those that were not blood descendants, it was still one law inside his household. Then when we fast forward to um, Genesis, I mean, uh, uh, Exodus 12, we see what the Passover, right? We see the Passover and circumcision it says one law to the homeborn and to the what? The strangers, right? One law, we see the consistency there. All through the scriptures, we see a consistency there, right? And then when we get to, and I just want to close out with this one, this one last verse here, right? When we start dealing with the commandments, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 22. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord, your God, to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto him. We see that right there in Torah. That's why uh, um, uh, Divine Prospect said it's imperative as for Christians to read the Torah so that way you could better understand um, um, the, the New Testament per se. So we see it all through the scriptures here. We see it right here in the scriptures uh, uh, confirm each other. So lastly, I'm going to close out with this last scripture here. Um, this is what um, Peter uh, uh, said about um, Paul, Second Peter, verse three, ver, um, um, chapter three, verse sixteen. As all, uh, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, epistles, right? Rather, um, letters, his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be hard. Um, excuse me, hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So many of us are many have, you know, confused or twisted Paul's words and added stuff there that what that Paul just blatantly did, did not say he did not. He's not teaching against the law. He's not teaching against honoring the, the most high because he had to go on trial. He had to say, look, you know, they, they called him and say, hey, Paul, we hear that you teach and that you don't have to uh, 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 abide by the laws. You don't have to uh, honor the covenant. And Paul had to make it clear that he's not teaching against Moses. Is, didn't, didn't he go on right. trial for that? So we have to be careful and put Apostle Paul's words in the proper context. Whatever you say, Paul said, the other disciples should have be able to, you should be able to read the other letters from the disciples and they should be able to bear witness on exactly what you're saying Paul is teaching. All right. So I just wanted to right. um, um, get that point. So I'm just going to go ahead and just um, uh, um, back out of here, but it's getting kind of late on here, you know, so I'm going yeah. you know, to have to. I'll uh, call it a wrap because I've been going nonstop since the Shab Shabbat in transition here, man. I'm, I mean, yes. so I'm sweating up in here and everything, you know what I mean? So, uh, but, but, but again, I just wanted to just uh, point those scriptures out and let's do this again. But, matter of fact, I I love, um, we do it on, um, go to um, uh, Divine Prospects as well, you know, the after party, but uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, old, older rather, right? You know what I mean? So the body won't communicate, you know, keep up with me. To, you know, my mind willing, but man, I don't know if my body can hang right now, but but definitely I like to come on your platform and we, we bring this over, this discussion over there um, because this is a great discussion that's much needed. So I want to say peace and blessings to Mike, uh, Elder Mike Holloway. I uh, really you, appreciate sir. you, brother. This is, I want to make this clear. This is nothing personal. We're doing exactly Amen. what they did in the scriptures, what we should be doing. We should be able to come together and have this discussion. And I Amen. give you props for taking the time to do this because most will not even put themselves in your position because they're scared of what losing credibility. They're scared mm. of what all the monies that are in their pockets by other people pushing whatever theology. So I appreciate you, brother, for you jumping out here. And I'm not saying that, uh, 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 you know, I didn't learn anything from you. One thing I, I, one thing I definitely learned from you 
is patience, right? And guess what? Look at how you look, look at how you patient with all of this. You came in, this is almost like the lion's den, so to speak. Because you're the only, <laughs> you know, so I give you credit and I, I just want to say I love you, brother. And resp- regardless of whatever differences that we have, we are still family. And yeah. that's what Christ taught. He said, even though, guess what? Love your neighbors. In other words, those that are in your media tribe. But he said, pray for your enemies. Actually, he's saying when you really study the text, he's saying, love those, um, um, pray for those that are not, I mean, that are in the opposite tribes. You know what I mean? So we're still family. We still, regardless of what side of the Jordan we're on, we're still family. And I appreciate you. Love you guys. Dr. Newell, Sister E, Pastor Kirtland, and all, of course, Divine Prosecutor. I don't know how you do it, man. You like everywhere, man. I saw you in New York, you in Texas. I'm like, man, what is going, how you, how is he able to do that? You know what I mean? But I, but I, I appreciate you and I love you, man. And, um, you know, you know, and I thank you for, encouraging me in some low spots that I had to deal with. One of the very few that reached out to me and gave me an encouraging word. So I really appreciate all you guys, but I'm gonna have to get up out of here. You know what I mean? Uh, I gotta, you, uh, we love you but too. I, I have right. to spend there, uh, even though it's late, but at least spend some time with the missus and, you know, um, um, and, and with the rest of the family. So I appreciate you guys. <laughs> love you. Uh, Shalom. Lock my shalom. to others. Shalom. You know, uh, so I'm, I'm going to say that there with no disrespect because some say shalom, some say shalom. It's not a deal breaker for me. So peace and blessings. Shalom. Tell my sister I say hi. Pastor Kelly. Me as well. Tell her I said hello. Give her my love. Yes. Will do. Will do. All right. Thank you, Sister E. Thank you so much for allowing me to be on this panel with these phenomenal people I enjoy myself do you hear me and i just want to say to uh, elder mike holloway as well thank you brother for your patience i appreciate you you contending for the faith that's what we're supposed to do and that's what i respect in you the fact that you contend for the faith no matter what and you stand on what you believe in and that's what we're supposed to do so i appreciate every single one of you and i'm i listen i'm not gonna lie i'm 55 years old i got to get my sleep or else i can't function <laughs> right okay so I am getting off of here now, but I love you, Sister E. I love you, my sis, Renice. Uh, Elder Ron, I love you, and I follow you as well, and I appreciate all that you're doing in the kingdom. I'm telling you, I'm tired, y'all. And when I get tired, I start to ramble, and I might start cracking jokes. So I'll leave before I start cracking them corny jokes, okay? Yes, I'm cracking the yo mama jokes. I'll be out. <laughs> Thank you, sis. I appreciate, appreciate so you, you as well, sis. Bless you. Okay, Bless so you as well. thank everybody. I want to say thank you, everybody, for your time, for your patience. I want to do this more. Uh, Elder uh, Mike Calloway, tell some of your peers to come on here. You know, you shouldn't have to come on here just you by yourself. You have to come and have others with you. And again, mm-hmm. there are things that you said I 100% agree with. There are things that other people said that I agree with. But because we all disagree on some things, it does not mean we need to not come together. I was trying to get uh, my brother, um, what's my brother, what's my brother, this Eastern Orthodox, Muhammad, turn the on here. But he has some other stuff he had to do. So I'm going to try to get more people out here. If anybody knows of any apologists that want to be engaged and want to do this, because I want to call, this was an introduction to a segment I want to start called the Roundtable. In the Roundtable, I want to get a multitude of people, not just Israelites not just Christians, not just Westernized Christians, but also Eastern, Orthodox, Ethiopian Christians. I want us to all come together and we should still be able to come on and just talk. Yeah. So if at any point, uh, Elder, I hope you come back. I hope everybody comes back. I Absolutely. want everybody to come back because I love this and this is what I want to do. I want us to just come and talk. We don't have to agree, but can we just talk? So yeah. um, I'm going to try to get Pastor Johnson. I might even snatch Brian up in here. Because Baran was all in the chat and he'd been messaging me on Messenger. I'm like, look, you're going to be on the next one. So I'm like, <laughs> now, if you come here, I might as well just say I'm going to put four hours aside because he's going to talk. But yeah. I'm going to get him on here. I'm going to get everybody on here. God bless y'all. Thank y'all so much tonight. Uh, before, I, before I close everybody, I'm going to let everybody give one minute on their closing remark. Go ahead, Elder. Well, just want to say thank you. I appreciate it, Sister E. 
Thank you to Pastor Kelly, amen, the doctor that left already, uh, Pastor Kirkland and Divine Prospect. Certainly appreciate it. The conversation was wonderful. I think it was encouraging. I think that it's important to hear all aspects and perspectives. And at the end of the day, you know, we all have to examine the scriptures for in them. We think we have eternal life, but those are they to testify of Christ. So so at the end of the day, we'll pray that God get the glory because none of us want it <laughs> and none of us deserve it. So God bless you. Thank you. I surely will come back again if I'm if invited. So thank you so oh, much. Definitely going to be invited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Elder Holloway, and you ain't going nowhere. Yeah, yeah. What you with me? Ask them. You stuck. I'm gonna be yeah. talking. So you ain't coming out of this. You with me? You a part of the game? Well, bless you. Part of the panel. So God bless y'all. My thank y'all so much. Y'all don't know how much this blessed me because this is what I've been wanting to see. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Most High is happy for us to just at least come together because we've been arguing and debating so in such a wrong way that we should be able to just talk. Just. Mm -hmm. So, uh, go ahead, Pastor, yeah. Pastor Renice. Yeah, Pastor Renice, I'm sorry. Thank I you. don't have anything to say. Listen, I was super nervous getting on here. Y'all, some big heavy hitters. Listen, this is my first debut. Listen, on the panel, and then on the panel with Divine Prospect, what you say? Come on here, <laughs> listen. I I'm feel like I'm on the ride now. I gotta come on nobody else's panel, <laughs> no other channel. Listen, I was challenged, but it's just good. This is how we sharpen iron, iron, sharpen iron, where we get better. There is no one really that's least or anything. This is how we get better, especially if we're saying we're trying to teach the truth of the word. So I was really edified. Um, you know, I appreciate everyone allowing me to even talk. Um, it's important that people, you know, if they see something special in you to allow you an opportunity that we represent the community well. And that's something we have to get better at, represent the community, not just the men, but females as well, that we're all one body. So I appreciate it. Um, and thank you again, Sister E, for the opportunity. And um, next time y'all have a panel, listen, I'm going to watch from the chat. No, you're not. You're coming up here, so you're done. You're part of so, All right, my brother Ron. I've been meaning to get him on here, and I finally have made uh, got him on here. So I'm excited about that. So what do you yeah, have? To I, say? I, yeah, I, I want to say um, I thank the Most High for allowing me an opportunity to speak with everybody here. Um, I, you know, I'm the thing that I'm most passionate about is when we can talk and still love each other afterwards, right? Um, if you know how the family dynamic is, I don't know how many people here have been to a family reunion before. Raise your hand. Right. So you've been a family reunion before, you know, you connected to all the people by blood, but everybody got issues. Everybody got an opinion. Everybody got something happening. But what, what sets us apart is how do we treat that individual? Right. Do we see them as an enemy because they have an issue? Right. And we don't know the full background story. Right. Because they say things they don't mean they may be upset. They may be bitter, angry, hurt. And we got to understand that a lot of us, you know, especially as black people, we haven't been to institutions of healing after all the damage has been done with us for years. This is why getting into uh, the scriptures is our form of healing, right? But in the process of healing, you cannot hurt somebody else's healing. You know what I'm saying? The peace that you receive is only as good as the peace you can give. And if we can come on here and be on one accord, even with dialogue, to begin to open up the scriptures and talk about something that that's not worldly. We could be talking about anything of the world right now. We could be doing anything of the world right now. But the fact that brothers and sisters are coming together here for the truth, to talk about it, to live it, to encourage each other, to do it, to be edified, to grow. And I got to be all the time. If you are in the truth of the most high and you get into a dialogue, you cannot lose. Either you're going to be able to convince a brother or sister to save their soul or you're going to learn. Right. And if you come into it for those principles, you will never lose. And I did not lose tonight because I learned something and I'm a student before I'm a teacher. And I thank the most high for even having the elder women in here because I learned something from them. And I don't know why people say they can't speak. I don't know what these churches doing. They bug it out. <laughs> you learned something from me. Yeah. Definitely. That's going on my Facebook status. Yes. That's going on my Facebook status yes. today. Yes. I'm kidding. I love you, sister uh 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 Renice Kirkland. You know, you know a Febby member of mine. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll let you I know who I'm talking do. about, right? Um, that's a big one, yes. That's a big one right there, Apostle, you know what I'm saying? But what I'm saying is, at the end of the day, it's all about in the spirit that you come in, right? And I, I, the good thing about Sister E, what I can say about her is that she has good discernment, right, of vetting people who to put together, right? Because she knew I could put these people on the same panel, and they're going to act like adults, and then they're going to represent their truth well. 
And I think that we've accomplished that because we're left as brothers and sisters. And as long as I can say, Elder, you're my brother, you know what I'm saying? If you need me, call me, email me, text me. And if I can be there, I could be there for you. You know what I'm saying? The people that disagree with you is who you show the love the most towards, not the ones who agree with you. You know what I'm saying? So thank the most high for that, man. Thank you, Sister E, for having a wonderful platform. I always, you know what I'm saying, recommend people to your platform. And I actually recommend a lot of sisters to this platform uh, because sometimes they want to hear from the sisters, right? And, and we as men cannot have such an ego that we cannot allow the sisters to teach us or even teach themselves. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I love the most high for that. I'm thinking for you, for you guys being here. And anytime you call me, Sister E, if I can answer the call, sis, I will be here to serve. And that's all I'm here to do. You know what Thank I'm saying? You. So I love everybody on this panel. I love you too, Sister E. I appreciate you. Love you too. Love you. So everyone in the pan in the chat, thank you all for joining us. Be prepared. We're doing this again. It looks like I may have to schedule this next week. So I'll be messaging everyone to see who's available. You know, I'm in the process of moving. So I'm going to have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> So, uh, but I am going to plan something for next week because we need to finish this. It was a lot of things that we needed to readdress, allow others to, you know, state their points. And I may pull in more people, but uh, I just want to thank everybody and uh, and give the most high praise because it's all about him. We all want to serve him in spirit and in truth. That's just plain and simple. So I just want to mm -hmm. thank everybody. God bless. And again, if any apologist wants want to come up here and again, this is going to be respectful. Email me and I will respond. Now, I have to look up to you, look and see what you do as far as your background, but I will definitely look into bringing you on because I want to I want to make this make sure that this is going to be a diverse community in which, you know, we can all have dialogue. So everybody, God bless. Everybody have a wonderful evening and good night.